Hello and welcome. My name is Katie Vincent and I work in public affairs at the Municipal Water District of Orange County. MODOC leads the Water and Energy Education Alliance, which is Southern California's alliance to build and bolster career pathways in water and energy for high school students. This is also a really exciting time for us because we've come together and realized that in the next decade, we are going to have a wave of industry re retirements. You guys are our key to the students to help them realize how important and valuable this precious resource is and that we have a ton of jobs that are coming up in the next decade. Many people on our team weren't interested in water initially and came to it in a roundabout way. This is why WIA is so important to allow students a pathway to see what their future could hold. It is very illuminating. We are going to save time for everyone by saying there are jobs for you in public affairs, water treatment, accounting. We have jobs for everyone. Water is integrated into everything that we do. Water is life. So we are excited that you're here today to learn about integrating water into your lesson plans. We have a great team of educators who are here to provide a great workshop for you. If there's anything you have questions on or any connections that can be made, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy that you're here today and we want to welcome you to this very important workshop. Our first introduction is Allison Loki. She wants you to know that this workshop has been a long time coming. It's something that we've been working on for a long time. Allison would like to thank the sponsors, MODOC and Metropolitan Water District of Southern California with Adrian Hightower. This would not have happened without our awesome sponsors. We have an exciting day planned for you all with a break, of course. You can take a look at the agenda. Now I would like to move on to our introduction of our facilitators. Allison Loki put this group together with Juanita and Kathleen. Allison has worked in the water industry for 20 years and has done everything from legislation to community affairs, to being the person who runs the mail or turns water on and off. She also brought, bought and sold water. She came to this position backwards. She was in school and needed to get a new job and started working as a customer service rep in water. And it was an excellent career choice. She came to realize that not only do we want people to know more about water and be better citizens, we also want people to come into the workforce. On this side, she's been writing curriculum, technical documents, and newsletters for about seven or eight years and teaching at Valley College, where she currently teaches water resource management and water use efficiency. I would also like to introduce Kathleen, who will be doing part of our presentation today. Really, Kathleen is the beginning of this idea. It was an idea that was in her brain, and that's what got everything started. If it hadn't been for her, it would have never happened. She is also adjunct faculty, who is now retired from San Bernardino County ROP, and is adjunct faculty at Cal State San Bernardino. Then there is Juanita. Juanita is probably the most caring, most passionate teacher we've ever had the pleasure of knowing. She's a little whirlwind who is hard to keep up with. You've really got to stay on your toes with her, but she cares about her students and has put so much time and effort into teaching her students science as well as water curriculum. Now we're going to do a quick activity called Above the Fold. Let me explain. You're going to go into a breakout room and look at an image assigned to your group. Then you will look at this slide and determine a headline that would be appropriate for that particular image. All of these images relate to water in one way or another. As a reminder, headlines are usually about seven words or less. Try to make it as catchy and eye-catching as you can. You've got about five minutes to do this. Okay, let's go to our breakout rooms now. So we're welcoming everyone back from our, our activity above the fold. Um, and I will turn this back over to Kathleen. Okay, thank you, Allison. So Bryce, if we can pull up the slides with the images, that would be great, please. Okay, so um, this is group number one. It's Amber 
excuse me, Amy, Clover, and Andy. Can somebody uh, read that for us? Sure, I can do it because I accidentally closed out of my poor team. So I, <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Andy. team. Uh, we got no oats, no water, no fun. How true. How true. That Absolutely. That was a great uh, above the fold headline. Thank you very much, group one. Group two, let's take a look at your image. Okay, this is Donna, Edna, and I can't see that far. Guru Mantra. Can somebody read that for us? Lake turns into desert. Lake turns into desert. And we can see that that's exactly what's happening there, right? Absolutely. Thank you very much, group two. And then um, who's our next group, Bryce? Okay, and this is group three of uh, who will <laughs> remain nameless. Uh, group three, somebody from group three, uh, please read your headline for us. I'll read it. So our headline is from the ocean to your faucet, desalination. And we were debating on how to say that word. <laughs> No, I think that I think you said it correctly. Desalination. Okay. Uh, that's the way I know how to say it. Maybe I'm wrong too. I don't know, but absolutely, that's that shows taking the ocean waters and doing some magic to it, and then having um, clear, fresh drinking water and water that we can use. Um, we don't see much of that yet, but I I think in the future we will. So I just wanted to give a very brief overview of where this program started. Um, I was at a meeting at Valley College several years ago and I happened to run across this brochure. I still have the brochure um, that talked about the water supply technology program that they had at Valley College. And when I started looking at it, it was, oh my God, next slide please. Oh my God, what do we got for our students? It shows here basically an entry level position in the water um, with a certification, $55,000. And that was pretty exciting for me coming from the San Bernardino area, Rialto, Fontana, where many, many students aren't going to a four-year college, don't have access, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, as far as a career path, I thought that was a great way to start. But my eyes really popped out when I looked at five years later, where, where young people are making 83,000 plus um, as annual salaries plus benefits. And that to me was a real game changer, not only for that young person, but for their extended families. And that is basically for many, many students who are beyond below the poverty line, this is access to the middle class. And this is where students, can, these young people can save and uh, towards retirement and have vacations and own a home. And it's a game changer. And so basically, um, as we were talking before we started the uh, training today, I wrote an SSP grant. And let's look at the next slide, if you don't mind, Bryce. So I wrote a, uh, find a little money, make a few friends. And that's exactly what I did. I wrote an SSP grant um, to be able to write some curriculum for the water program that you see. I made a few friends along the way. And yes, I did. Juanita and Allison were friends that I got to make early, early on in this, this little um, road trip of ours. We had a three-day training where we brought Cal State, Valley College, business, um, uh, high school teachers, science teachers together. And we just kind of kicked the tires, if you will, to see where did we want to go with this. And from there, we developed high school academic and CTE courses that focus on water. And that was over the next several years. Um, next slide, Bryce. There's six courses listed here. There's three science courses and three CTE courses. There's actually a seventh course that was written and it's um, Water Wars and it's about uh, policy and government um, reaction to the water industry. And it uh, satisfies um, government and econ as a, as a A through G course. So all of these courses are A through G and I know Juanita is going to talk quite a bit about them in the future. Her teachers were the ones that really, really helped develop, um, 
most of these, certainly the science courses. And um, Allison took the lead on the CTE courses and we could not have done it without her expertise. So that's sort of where we got started. That's how we're here. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Allison who's gonna tell you more about the water program. Okay, I'm back. Thank you, Kathleen, for that um, introduction. So some of you were here on Monday and you'll notice that the slides are either the same or similar, but I'm gonna add more information, but there are some people who were not here Monday. So there's, um, I almost love to talk about nothing more than water. I loved working in the water industry um, and I love California. So it's a perfect combination for me. Katie just came back from vacation somewhere else and she said, oh, I'm glad to be back home in California. And there's good reason for that. California is such an interesting state and we all love it so much that we have almost 40 million people living here now. But what's really critical about that is 30 million of us at least live below that red line where there's no water. So the rest of the state, the central part of the state, the northern part of the state has about eight to 10 million people and the rest of us all live here in the central basin areas or in the Los Angeles area which explains a lot, right? It explains why it's difficult to get concert tickets, the incessant traffic. But if you look outside today, like I am, it's a beautiful, beautiful day with no bugs and no rain. So we have this huge population here because of this fantastic weather, but we don't have any water in our locality. We don't have any close by water. We are as a state now the fifth largest economy in the world. So if we were our own country, we would be number five, and it is entirely dependent on water. And this morning I was thinking about it because this is a little bit different flavor, right? This is CTE. And I was thinking in the beginning of COVID and there were a lot of essential workers out there, even what we think of as grocery store workers or hospital workers or people who kept our lives going during the pandemic. But I'm not sure how many people realize that Water is an underpinning to all of that. So when COVID started, I mean, we scrambled to make sure that A, our employees wouldn't get sick, we could still provide water because that's our mission, that's our duty. And where I worked in my last position, we had moved everybody home who could be home within three days out of 200 employees. But that still meant that there are water workers there monitoring that water and sewer system um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's what we need more of is dedicated people who will do that and go the distance to make sure people have what they really need to survive. All of us being home wouldn't have been very pleasant if we hadn't had drinking water and flushing toilets. So I was just thinking about that this morning. Throughout our state, 80% of our water use is agriculture. On any given day, one person in five around the world eats something grown in California. One person in five worldwide. That's a phenomenal number. And that's from that extremely fertile Central Valley area right down the center of the state where you see a lot of water actually on our map. 20% of us are urban dwellers, right? It, so, or 20% of our water is used by urban dwellers. And that kind of leads to other issues. During the last drought, 2012 to 2017, really the onus was on urban water people to reduce their water use. That freed up more water from ag for agriculture and other important uses. However, this time around probably won't be the same thing. I did cut back a fair amount last time. They'll have to face a lot more severe cutbacks with this upcoming drought, which we'll talk about in a minute. We are environmentally diverse. We have deserts, we have mountains, we have Mount Whitney. We have, uh, I think the Furnace Creek is the lowest point. We have numerous rivers located in the central part of the state, all draining the Sierra Nevada mountains. We have extremely variable precipitation patterns within California. Two inches in the Mojave Desert to 92 in Cas Gasquet, which is in the very Northern tippy top. Um, coastal uh, city, 92 inches of rain on an average annual year. But it's not just the average annual rainfall or precipitation that's important because it's more variable than that. We have the most variable change, 
weather swings in the United States. So you cannot count on average rainfall here. What you do is you collect as much water as you can when you have a good wet year and you save it because you know that next year you may only have two inches. And typically in Southern California, you'll look at a, a, a rainfall pattern or precipitation pattern and it's two inches one year, three inches the next year, and then 38 inches the year after that. And then it drops back to something um, ridiculously small. So we have to bank our water, we have to hoard our water for the next dry spot times. And our population centers are typically so far from water that it has caused us to develop these incredible engineering projects to move water to people. They are, in my opinion, truly engineering feats. Whether you're for the Delta project or against the Delta project, you're for imported water or against imported water, it doesn't change the fact that it's amazing that we can move water, not just within our own state, but from other states to get to us here. I mean, water's heavy. It's eight pounds a gallon. Most of us will use at least 70 gallons a day, at least. So the fact that we can supply it we can treat it, we can distribute it, and we can bring it to your house and at incredibly cheap cost is amazing. So next slide, please. The water industry is unfortunately really confusing for non-industry people in that, and here's like the most basic, right? Water providers have different names. They can be public or private. Most water agencies within California are public water agencies. There are some private water agencies. Um, Golden State Water is an example in the Claremont area, but most of us get a municipal water supply. Sometimes cities provide water, okay? Like I used to work in the city of Corona. I live in the city of Riverside. Those cities provide water. They are retail water providers, but sometimes you have agencies that provide directly to retailers. And that makes, so think of it as a layer, right? You have the retailer, which in my case is the city of Riverside, but they get their water, imported water from someone else, which is an agency. So water can be quite confusing. Then you also have districts, special districts often, and they provide water. So you can live in one town and then the very next town gets their water provided to them through a different structure. And that makes it hard for non-industry people to understand. Um, I teach at Valley College. I have a whole spiel about how does this actually work? Who gets paid? Who, where does the water come from? Even though you can have water providers right next door to each other in different, in like Ontario and Arupa Valley, for example, they rely on very different supply sources depending on their own water rights and their own contracts. So they can be next door to one another but it doesn't matter. Their supplies are completely different. And here's different supply types. Most of us have groundwater or access to groundwater, which is your cheapest supply. If you look at a place that has cheap water rates, it's because they have a lot of groundwater. There's also surface water. Lytle Creek is an example of surface water. The Santa Ana River is an example of surface water. But surface water is very drought prone. Groundwater is slow to react to a drought, but it's also um, slow to react to coming out of a drought. Surface water is very quick. You've got one year of drought, your surface water supplies dry up. So you use it when you can. Um, San Antonio Creek is another example. It's a tiny little creek coming out of Mount Baldy, but when it runs, it provides a phenomenal amount of water for the water providers below it. Then we have recycled water, which is purple pipe. Orange County is way ahead of the game on purple pipe. There are pockets of recycled water throughout the Inland Empire in LA County, but Orange County saw it quick and saw it fast. Recycled water is an expensive water supply. You have to build an entirely different infrastructure for it because you can't run recycled water through your potable water pipes. So they must be completely separate. And you have to treat wastewater to a different level to be able to use it as recycled water. Those that started early, and I can think of a couple in Orange County and a couple in the Inland Empire, they're in much better shape to resist a drought 
because they have irrigation water coming to them and we don't have to use potable water for irrigation. Because like it or not, most of the water that we buy or we import or we pump and treat and distribute, most of that water goes to somebody's grass. In the summer, about 80% of water that we go to that much trouble for will go to grass. So using recycled water when an option is excellent. You will hear some about toilet to tap, which means, which we don't have here, where you flush the toilet, it goes to treatment and it's immediately distributed back out to um, drinking water supplies. We really don't have that here. You have that a lot in other countries. People are not ready for that yet here, but we do use recycled water a lot for irrigation. You have desalinized water. That's along the coast. That is by far the most expensive source of supply. And there are some serious environmental concerns with it. I'm not saying it won't happen, but it's a very, very expensive project and it's very long-term and it will only benefit people living directly on the coast. It's not going to Im impact people in Riverside, for example. It's not going to impact people in any Inland Empire area because you cannot afford the infrastructure to pipe it. It's that, it's, it's expensive. But the plant itself is very expensive as well. Is it coming? Sure. I think we'll get more and more of it, but it's a long way off. So imported water is the source of the most controversy probably within California. And that's because we call imported water anything that is not directly basically under our, under our feet. But if, if we're not in a groundwater basin and we're not using surface water and we bring it from somewhere else, we call it imported water. Whether that's central or northern California, Colorado River Aqueduct, and that is expensive because water is heavy and hard to move. Especially if you remember back to that map where I had the red line coming through it, they have to cross the Tehachapi Mountains with that water. It either goes through the mountain or up and over. At eight gallons, um, a gal eight pounds a gallon, you can imagine the cost uh, especially in power, to move that water. Imported water is always the biggest source of controversy. Northern California and Central California are not real happy about sending their water south. Let's just leave it there. This isn't an imported water class. And then conservation has all of a sudden is no longer the, the red-haired stepchild of the water world. Conservation is now considered a way to, it's a supply, it's a supply chain. Somebody mentioned native plants earlier, their native plant garden. If we could get everyone to remove at least part of their grass, we wouldn't have the water problems that we have now. If 80% of your summer supply is going to watering grass, a product that you cannot eat, that's gonna make a big, big difference in what you need. So much of conservation, and I see some conservation folks on here, it's really about getting you to reduce your water usage. This can be difficult. We call that hardening your demand. The last drought from 12, 2012 to 2017 was a real problem because we asked everybody to reduce their water use and they did. And most people have not gone back to pre-drought levels. Most people have stayed where they were. How do we ask them to reduce more? If you already um, converted your landscape, you already converted your appliances. You're already taking a shorter shower. What are you gonna do next? So we need to concentrate on those people who are not early adopters or true believers and get them to follow along. So next slide, please. So we talked about the, the drought, right? And um, drought's a serious business for California, but it's not new. We consistent, you can just count on it. We're gonna have another drought and it's gonna be severe and it's gonna really impact everything. You can just, you can write a check on it. It's that easy. We've had nine significant droughts since 1840. Some of them more than five years long. Um, we just finished the 2012 to 2017 drought. And um, that was, we haven't even had time to recover from that one. Groundwater basins haven't refilled yet. So here's some headlines. Kathleen's really great about sending me headlines when I don't catch them. 
And here's some of the more recent headlines about this upcoming draft. Um, there, we'll talk about environmental concerns in a minute, but the one that I really wanna highlight here, well, there's two. Um, the second one from the bottom about Lake Mead. Lake Mead is a, a water supply for Los Angeles, right? It, it's important, but it's really important for Las Vegas. That's their basically their only water supply. So that entire city runs on recycled water and the tiny, tiny allotment they get from Lake Mead. So as much as it might hurt us in LA, it's really gonna impact Southern Nevada. And then the other one was um, this article is concerned with needles. They're down to one water well. As hot as it is there, <coughs> excuse me, they have no water. I mean, we will be to a point where we have to truck water into them because there's just no water for them. So we can count on repeating droughts. We all need to get, need to get into that saving mindset and maybe stay there. So next slide, please. This is um, the US Drought Monitor and you can look at it state by state. And this, I took this snapshot from July 22nd, a week ago today. And we watch it because they monitor what's going on in our state and how is the drought deepening or, or contrarily, like when we had the drought was lifted in 2017, the whole state was white. We got so much rain that in April or May that year, the governor, it was Governor Brown, I believe, lifted the drought because the entire state was white, meaning none. Everything is fine. So we're looking at these drought levels and I'm going to start by saying that their, their measurement of drought might be a little unrealistically easy. And by that, I mean, we don't have enough water supply on a normal year, on a good year to support all the people that we have. If we did, we wouldn't bring water from other states. I mean, so just start there. We have to import water just to keep us going in a good year. We might import less water, but you have a city like San Diego who has basically no groundwater. They survive on imported water all the time. I'm not putting a value judgment on this. I'm just saying this is what it is. Now, if you put these abnormal, these dry conditions on top of the fact that we have a lot of people here and we really have limited water resources, there you have it. This is where we were as of last Thursday. Every part of the state is impacted, either from abnormally dry, but what's really um, frightening to me at this part of the summer is that it's exceptional drought throughout the central, the lower central valley, and then the upper central valley. It's exceptional, it's not even extreme, it's exceptional. It means it's dry as a bone. What happens then? What happens to all that agriculture? Will you pump more groundwater? You just pump more groundwater, which is not really very well regulated to tell you the truth. They just are starting to do their groundwater management plans now. So what happens when you pump a lot of groundwater and you just keep pumping groundwater? Well, you get a lot of subsidence, which we'll see a picture of. You can't refill a groundwater basin that's been allowed to subside. So this kind of thing, just as an aside, during the last drought, we printed this every single week, it comes out every week. And in my office, we had it all the way around the room so we could watch a progression of the drought. And then the end of it too. Next slide, please. So subsidence is, the picture at the bottom is a good example of subsidence. If you over pump a groundwater basin, and the land shrinks because it's not the dirt holding up the water. It's really the water holding up the dirt. So if you remove the, the water from the soil, and you don't allow it to replenish, it compacts, it subsides, and you have problems like you see with this road. Now, we can't drive on that road, which means we now have to fix that road. It's not just the road. It's all sorts of things subside. Houses subside. Um, infrastructure subsides, it can go on and on and on. Better to regulate that and like save ourselves all the time and drop all the drunk. So what are the drought repercussions? Well, economically, drought is really, really bad for business. And I, I took down a few numbers. In, the, in 2014 to 2016, not the entire drought period of time, 
agriculture lost $3.8 billion. Now, none of us like starved to death, probably we still had, you know, we still had food growing in the Central Valley. That's a huge, huge economic loss to the state and the things that trickle down from there. But it's also a huge loss in food supply. I mean, as much as I, I, uh, I love things like what happened, technology that happens in Silicon Valley, you can't eat a, uh, a microchip, right? You gotta have food, food is important. So $3.8 billion in agriculture loss. It's not just that, you have outdoor recreation, which sounds so trivial, but it's a huge part of our state. Um, skiing, fishing, boating, these are all big economic drivers for our state because we have so much diversity and there's so much to do here. Uh, you have environmental losses. I put a picture in of the tree deaths during the last drought. They, the best estimate was 102 million trees died in the forest during the last drought. They can't withstand diseases or the, the bark beetle. It's one thing to have one year of drought, right? The trees can usually dig in and they'll be okay. When you have sustained years of drought, they just finally die off, which is deforestation, which leads to a whole other set of problems. Fish kill. Kathleen sent me an article yesterday um, about all the loss of fish because when you have less water in rivers, right? The water is warmer because it's less deep. And so a lot of these fish can't survive that. California supports 129 species of freshwater fish. About two thirds of these are found only in California. When you have low flows, which creates high temperatures and it reduces water, water quality, these fish die. They don't typically come back. And fishing is an industry here. It's a huge industry. It's an economic loss. Um, hydropower shut down. Allison, Allison, can I um, just throw in an idea there? Because um, I know that it's noticed that there's a lot of science teachers on the call. Um, what you should know is that that idea of the change in temperature causing um, causing lower levels of oxygen and causing fish to die off is actually a science phenomena that could be utilized in your physical science standards. There's a physical science standard that goes along with um, that goes along with uh, temperature and um, dissolved oxygen. Um, that would be an excellent follow-up to what she just spoke about. Thank you, Juanita. Thank you for that help. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about on this slide, uh, well, maybe not, is hydropower. Um, in 2014 to 2015, they cut hydropower production by 50%. So how do you get the power you need? Well, you substitute gas and turbine generation, right? Which causes greenhouse gases. So, and Las Vegas is really gonna struggle with this from Lake Mead when the water levels get so low. So we need the hydropower. Hydropower is a pretty clean source of energy. When we shut that down, things change for us. Um, literally, rural people run out of water. They're pumping water from those same groundwater basins where agriculture is, and they literally run out of water. In the Central Valley, there are several communities who have never received drinking water again since the last drought. Everything is bottled. So it's not just a contamination problem, it's an actual supply problem for them. And I'm expecting that urban users will ask to be cut back again um, very shortly. They'll mandate it again, they'll have to because you saw the drought situation. Next slide, please. And now, I think that was all, yeah, that was all my thing. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Juanita. Hey, everybody, okay, so. Uh, <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and. So do my gloom, so do my yeah, we're going to go ahead and we're going to say, yeah, like uh, environmental anxiety is a real thing. In fact, there's been like recent studies talking about kids where where that is something that teachers really need to keep in mind. And if you were here with us on Monday, we talked about it a little bit in that we were talking about um, environmentalists have done a really good job at giving us the facts and details that go along with the evidence that supports that the climate is changing, the climate is shifting, and that they're there are, it, you know, we can use that evidence to make predictions about what will happen in the future. 
However, um, as an environmental movement, and I would consider myself as, as, you know, a member of that environmental movement, what we've also recognized is we've done a very poor job at teaching people what it is that they can do about it. And what that's led to is that's led to um, a couple of things. Um, environmental anxiety is one. And the second one is... Um, is strategic avoidance, strategic avoidance behaviors being things like when people say, oh, well, you know, the climate, what, well, we can't do anything about that. We just have to, you know, we're living, we have to just enjoy our time here right now. And we don't need to worry about the future. Those mid-year projections, they're not looking too good, but I'm not expecting to really be here much longer than mid-year, you know, mid-century anyway. So, uh, so we don't need to worry about that. That's for somebody else. The kids do not feel that same way. The kids very adamantly are like the grownups are messing it up and uh, and we don't know what to do about it. So in a lot of ways, we can utilize that as really building a really strong why for why we want to do this. Um, in our district, we've had a like a huge environmental literacy push. Our goal is to really graduate climate warriors. And so if you were here with us on Monday, which a lot of you were, uh, we talked about that just a little bit. I know the UC and the CSU system just had a um, just had a uh, a larger conversation with the K twelve system, um, and that if you want to look it up on Google, it was called Eclipse E C C L P S, and I can't remember what it, all of those things stood for, but essentially the UC and the CSU system are also um, advocating, I think, to graduate something like half a million climate activists by the time they, you know, come out of the of their system. Knowing that um, they also, there was a conversation at that session where they were talking about requiring things like environmental science as a graduation requirement, regardless of majors at um, both the UC, in the, both the UC system and the CSU system, which I think would be amazing because we, that environmental literacy really um, allows for students to better navigate all of the data that's coming to them. It's better, it, it allows them to analyze that information better, make better um, health choices for themselves, for their own wellness and for their families as well. Um, uh, in the chat feature, I put a couple of things. I was really excited about what Allison was saying about the, about the fish lab. And I know that sounds um, that sounds weird to say that I was excited about the fish, but I, I was excited about the fish because if you are using any probeware, especially as we go back to as we go back to in-person instruction, I think it's going to be really important that we re-engage students for their incomplete learning by doing lots of things that are hands-on. So if you have any probes, the most popular ones I feel like are the Vernier probes and Vernier actually along with their probes um, has labs pre-written. So one of them is this dissolved oxygen lab. And so I put the link in the chat feature for that lab. And um, I can't remember what performance expectation it is, but it is one of the PSs and I think it's high school PS. It's something in the two. Um, so it's a chemistry ish kind of standard that goes along with temperature. Um, for the purposes of today, it, it, we are really going to talk about career technical education. So there was a shift in language um, with ESSA, which is the Every Student Succeeds Act, that shifted high school language from A through G, which was our old high school language that really just focused on college, to CCI, which now focuses high schools on their college college career indicator. That college career indicator is based on a few things. Now just being A through G or being college ready doesn't necessarily tell the state that your students are prepared for all of their post-secondary needs. And so when you're thinking about the dashboard, the district dashboard, your school dashboard, your principals are going to be talking a lot more about it because they, you know, that's how schools are rated. <clears throat> so with the CCI, it's really, there are seven different ways that a student can be considered college and career ready. The first one is, you know, I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's, there's definitely one where it's just, you take, you've got your graduation, regular diploma requirements, you've got your A through G requirements, and then you've passed your ELA and your math CASP test which sounds like that's easy enough, but actually it's a big challenge for a lot of kids in California. There's also one where it's like, oh, you've passed some AB or I, uh, AP or IB 
tests as well. There are two different, uh, three different measures. They're called measures in the state. There are three different measures that are related to career technical education, where a student is considered college and career ready if they have completed a CTE pathway and maybe done one other, one or two other things. And so career technical education pathways are getting a lot more, there's a lot more interest just in general around those ideas. Um, if you are familiar with CTE, <clears throat> What you'll know is that in order for something to be considered a complete pathway, you have to have at least 300 instructional hours in a, um, in a certain sequence. And those sequences have lots of different designations, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the way that it, that it ends up factoring out, we have 180 days in a year. We have, you know, uh, we have periods that are about 50 minutes long if you don't have, you know, block classes. So usually you'll find a lot of CTE pathways that are a sequence of two courses. And, um, and I'm going to leave it up to the district people to decide what those two courses are. I'm not sure um, if, if it seems like a lot of people on the call are teachers, but if you have additional interest in figuring out um, what that sequence would look like, which classes, that whole piece, uh, go ahead and put those questions in the chat and I'll address those questions as they come up. Amy, I talked to Amy earlier, and Amy was asking a little bit about um, how to become a CTE teacher just in general. So I want to take a second to talk about that. So Bryce, can I share my screen for just a second? <clears throat> uh, let me see if I can do this accurately. Oh, look, look at me. I was looking up that uh, dissolved oxygen lab because I was like, we need to share this. Oh. Here we go. Um, if you hear some background noise, I apologize that for that. I am working from home. And so there we go. This is what I'm looking for. So this is a document from the, uh, the CTC, so the California Commission of Teacher Credentialing. And what you should know about being a CTE teacher is that you have to have uh, three years or 1,000 hours, so 3,000 hours, three years of 1,000 hours of paid or unpaid work experience. Um, and you have to have work experience in a potential industry sector. You can have a combination of a variety of different uh, requirements. So position of the advanced industry certification or 48 semester units of post-secondary vocational training. If you are a teacher, you can count one year of teaching experience, but you still have to have, um, you still have to have some alternative ways of meeting that work experience piece. That work experience piece becomes hugely important. In my district, I've been trying to get people designated, getting their CTE designation when they're teachers in other subject areas, because that's hugely helpful too. Um, but what I can tell you about that is they're not wiggling. There's not a, they don't do that wiggle room when it comes to that, uh, that last thousand hours. So they'll count some of your regular, like, um, just coursework that you took as a, uh, you know, as an undergraduate or whatever, but they won't, um, they won't budge on that last thousand hours. And that thousand hours has to have happened in the last three years. If it's in the last five years, then it's a different set of, um, it's a different number. Are there any questions about just the CTE credentialing before we move on? Yeah, um, Juanita, this is Kathleen. I'm just wondering if you could just give a thumbnail sketch of what kinds of things might be applicable as far as that thousand hours for, for students who are, for us who might be interested in getting a CTE credential. Yeah, so for sure. So um, if you're talking about a paid, obviously, this, the stuff that's the easiest is the paid stuff. Like I have a side job that I do on the weekends where I'm a gardener on the weekends and I do so many hours. What your documentation, your ev evidence documentation ends up looking like is it's letters from employers saying that you are, you know, you have done this work that you, that you claim you have done. They also take things that you do not get paid for. And when we say they take things that you do not get paid for, there was an experience, not with me personally, but with the colleague where they got their teacher, a CTE credential, I think in, um, I think it was, uh, energy environment and utilities. 
And they got theirs because they had a scuba license. So they were taking classes for scuba. The scuba fit in with what it was that they were trying to do in some way. I can't remember because it wasn't my story. This is a story that I was told from a, a colleague. Um, but that kind of stuff also works. If you're like a camp counselor or you do something, you, you are a volunteer firefighter, um, you have your CERT certification. So CERT is like the community response team. Those things all count. Yeah. And and also, didn't you have a, a teacher or two or we discussed something about externships in the water industry that would count toward that a thousand hours? Did Yeah, for sure. So, yes, you can also do externships. And in some situations, your district, while you're not being paid by the externship location, you can uh, be being paid by your district if your district wanted to do something like that. Almost all CTE programs, when you're doing professional development for career technical education and you're using some kind of grant funding in order to pay for that, the um, professional development that you can pay for um, cannot be like just general you know, teaching PD, it has to be specialized PD. And a lot of people, as their specialized PD, arrange for externships. And so you count that as hours. So an externship is just like a student internship where basically you build a partnership with an industry person and perhaps you just shadow certain people in their jobs for a certain number of hours. <clears throat> but what I can tell you is that no district is going to be able to afford to do that for the full thousand hours. That's a lot of time. And, uh, and teachers with all the benefits and, you know, union contracts and stuff like that, you can't get it for that long. But if you find those pieces and you kind of smush them together, I've got, you know, I've got an externship for this number of hours. I've got some, you know, a hobby that I've done for this number of hours. I've got, uh, you know, these many certifications. You can, you can claim all of that and acquire your CTE credential and you can keep your, you know, your regular credential. So you have a science credential. I have my science credential and I have a CTE credential. Great. Thank you. Was that clear? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Amy, did that answer your question? Yes. Does anybody have any externships available? Water district people. <laughs> hey, I like the way you're thinking. You're already thinking like a CTE teacher because you got to get that hustle on girl. Good job. CTE. Good. Start reaching out, hustle. Katie Bryce, just so you know. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Bryce, did you hear that? She was, she was doing the, the shout out. Oh, so yeah. they're good. Excellent. Um, we'll see what we could do there. Uh, we, there are 15 different CTE industry sectors, um, and there's lots of opportunity in those sectors to be very, very creative with what it is that you're trying to do. Um, energy environment and utilities is the one that is the most likely fit for something that's directly related to water. But I liked what I think Patricia was telling me a little bit earlier, and I'm not sure if you're, um, if you're, science uh, illustrations class falls into the CTE category, but um, there are lots of opportunities to write some creative curriculum here. Um, our building and trades construction, for example, in our building and trades construction, instead of it just being regular like construction or carpentry, we have a course called green construction and green construction we wrote and it has all of those environmental factors in mind. What you do, what we do know is living in California that we were one of the states, you know, we were a state that signed on to the Paris, um, the Paris Accord or the Paris Agreement um, as it relates to climate change. So as a state, we are going to be making efforts in this um, in this direction. We're transitioning our auto shop classes from just regular, you know, regular combustion engines to being shop classes that also focus on electric engines. So any so think about about it in a really creative way. Maybe I want to teach, you know, I want to teach uh, an innovations class, just regular innovations. It might fall into, or my experience maybe is in engineering and design. Maybe I'm doing something with engineering and design, but I can figure out how to overlay water on top of that. So it's water engineering. Um, it's uh, thinking about things like aqueducts and, uh, you know, gravity fed systems, but really like building those things, all those engineering components. Uh, again, transportation, maybe we're going to look at the Mirai that just emits just water, their, their system, they have a hydrogen car. So be creative. 
Next slide, please. The next thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about standards for just a second. So in CTE, we have a set of standards that are called, uh, they are called the model curriculum standards. So those model curriculum standards, I'm going to stop, I'm going to share my screen one more time, Bryce, if that's okay. The model curriculum standards are, let's see if I brought them up here for energy. Oh, I got to actually share the screen. Wah, wah, just like somebody was saying. Let's act like I've done this before all day, every day last year. Okay. Energy, you want environment and utilities. So what you can see here is this an example of the model curriculum standards, just like in all the other content areas, the career technical education classes have a set of standards that they're supposed to um, utilize when structuring, uh, when structuring their lessons as well. Uh, what you'll notice is that they are much more they're much broader though in their scope um, than the regular, like a regular set of content standards might be. So in this first one that has to do with communications, it's just, you know, effectively communicating the career planning, making sure that you are integrating multiple, you know, sources of career information so that students are well aware what they need to do in order to actually get a job in those areas. For technology, uh, there's a set of standards here, uh, problem solving, critical thinking, health and safety, resp responsibility and flexibility, and then ethics and legal responsibility, teamwork, technical skills and knowledge, demonstration and application. What I can say about career technical education classes just in general is that the goal of the class is that a student that leaves high school should have a competitive advantage in the job market. That's the official kind of language language that goes along with that um, just from taking that set of classes and truthfully that is what we are trying to get them to have. Bryce, you can start sharing again. Along with the model curriculum standards, there's also another set of legislation which we talked about on Monday that aren't necessarily standards, but it is. Um, it was a piece of legislation that moved forward that's that we are supposed to teach. Um, they are the California Environmental Principles and Concepts, and we call these EPNCs very often. There are five different principles, and I you can read, so I'm not going to read the slide for you. But what I can tell you is that the long and short of it is that students need to understand that both natural um, natural systems and human social systems very commonly overlap and the interactions between them overlapping can be both negative which is the ones that we hear about all the time but they can also be which is equally important they can also be positive and they can be neutral and so what we're trying to teach kids is we're trying to teach students that there are ways as we're thinking about new things that we're doing we're not saying stop progress we're saying as we are progressing and moving forward and building and making society better that we're also thinking about the health and wellness of our natural systems so that we can have a positive impact on those systems or a neutral impact like i said on monday the la the first the one that I feel like personally is the most important to convey to students is principle number five, because there's also a misconception out there that if you are an environmentalist or if you are environmentally literate, that you just are like some tree hugging hippie that uh, is like, no, we don't want to build. We don't want to do anything. We just want to you know, just love the planet and tear down the establishment. And that's not true. Uh, principle five is really focused on decision making. And that's the part that I think most students will have, um, most students will have the most, uh, the most opportunities to practice as an adult, right? They need to recognize the de decisions affecting resources and natural systems. There's a broad range of considerations that occur when you're making those decisions and that everybody's point of view is valid. It's, it's a balance of how we're going to balance that out in order to move forward. Next slide. Because there are so many people on the call that um, have seen kind of some of the presentation before, I'm going to ask you guys to bear with me. We're going to switch up the slide order just a little bit to accommodate for um, some of that. Um, on Monday, what we talked about was we talked about all of those science courses. And so today, what we're really going to talk about is we're going to talk about the solely CTE courses. So they don't have that dual designation. They are just CTE courses, which are amazing courses as well. The first one is get in get in the water careers with the future 
these are G level classes. So the classes that we talked about on Monday were D level classes. These are G because they're CTE classes. The recommendation is really that they don't occur in the ninth grade year, but that they occur in the 10th, 11th or 12th grade year because students schedules are so impacted in their 10th grade year. So if any of you are high school teachers, you know what I'm talking about. They've got their history requirements and all their requirements. It doesn't really leave them a lot of space for electives. What you'll find is that most, most of these classes are all offered 11th and 12th grade. Ninth grade is pretty open, but the issue that's going to be coming up is that there's going to be a new state required ethnic studies classes. So we think that the ninth grade year is going to fill up pretty quick too. So uh, that's the first one. The second one is called Water Works, Next Generation Careers in the Water Industry. Look, that one's spelled wrong. I love it when that happens, when like the UC, <laughs> when schools spell stuff wrong and then they publish it. That's my favorite thing in the whole world. Anyway. <laughs> And then the last one is called Geographic Information Systems for the Water Industry Mapping Our Resources. We're going to talk a lot more about geographic information systems today because those are amazing and, um, and there's lots of applications for that. So we're going to do an activity that goes along with that. Um, there's transcript abbreviations. So these didn't just come from anywhere. These titles, these titles came from UC Regents. So all coursework that goes into high school has to be submitted to UC Regents to make sure that it meets the rigor of the UC and CSU system. These courses have um, been, you know, have been approved already. So if in your district you wanted to offer one of these courses, excuse me, or a set of these courses, then um, you could just go on and adopt them because they're already there and available for you. Um, if you are a district level person, you would adopt two of these courses because the two courses would be considered a pathway. So you'd have to have your concentration course and your capstone course. So like I was saying about those 300 hours. And if you have additional questions about that, go ahead and put those in the chat and we can move on. <clears throat> So some of you have seen this video already, but for those of us who haven't seen it, we're going to play it one more time. Um, just like Amy was saying, uh, you have to always be ready on your hustle when you're a CTE teacher. You got to look for those networking opportunities to deal with all of the different water agencies and anybody that you run across that is just looking like they're really engaging in somebody that might give students a competitive advantage in the job market. Um, and so um, when you're talking to those people, you have to be ready with the ask right away. Oh, I saw this. I thought this was interesting. Hey, do you think you'd be able to partner with me? When you're asking people to partner, usually they're like, yeah, what does that mean? What do I have to do? And so you want to give them different levels of engagement to choose from. So on the left hand side of your screen, you'll see that there are different examples of levels of engagement. The ones at the top are the like the lowest level. That sounds really strange. I should have organized it differently, but whatever. That means they're the easiest. And the ones at the bottom are really being a very concrete, like it's going to take a lot longer in order to do those. Um, we're going to watch a video with uh, some of my friends. Marlin and Dayton, uh, and they work in the water industry. So going back to that ask, I was taking a tour of the wastewater treatment facility and uh, we came back and they were like, oh, so after the tour, they were like, do you have any questions? And I was like, I sure do. Can I record you? <laughs> and so this was totally on the fly. And they said yes. And this video was taken with my cell phone. So, uh, so without further ado, as you're watching this video, I want you to think about, I'm going to give you a listening target. Sorry, Bryce. I'm going to give you a listening target. The listening target is what stood out the most about this video to you? What do you think that your students will take away from it? Or what would you want your students to take away from it? Now I'm going to stop talking, Bryce. Go ahead. Uh, because if you are going to, like I mentioned before, stay in the state of California, Southern California being at that, you're going, there are going to be too many creative ways to come up with water, reusing water, uh, renewable energy, uh, turning biosolids into fertilizer, uh, methane gas, there's just a lot of avenues that come from the water, wastewater, mainly the wastewater side of the house. So if uh, people plan on staying as you get older, starting a family and staying in Southern California, you're going to pay close attention to water and wastewater. There's going to be different types of cogen systems where you're using methane gas to produce electricity, to power up facilities, and so on and so forth. And who knows? Maybe in the future it'll even get as big as, you know, communities. I don't know, you know, uh, residential areas. But as of now, 
Uh, you, you just can't, we don't, we have too many people here and not enough water. We got to get more creative. We got to find ways to reuse water. So it's, uh, I would say probably environmentally might be in the forefront of everything more more than anything else. My path into the water industry kind of fell into my lap. I uh, joined the Air Force in 2002. My original job that I signed up for was a crew chief. Then at the end of boot camp and all that, they were like, sorry, you're tech school, which is your on-the-job type training. Uh, is backlogged for like nine months. So do you want to get back out and go back home and come back nine months later? I said, nope, I'm already here in Texas. If you let me go back home, I'm not coming back. So then they uh, gave me a list of different jobs. And um, when I signed up for it, it was actually it stated utility systems in general. And they're like, yeah, you get to work with electricity and, you know, some water stuff. And I was like, okay, it sounds pretty cool. And uh, when I found out more in depth on what it was, I was like, man, I don't really want to do this kind of stuff. Then um, went through it. Uh, seemed very interesting. There's a lot of science, uh, both chemistry and microbiology. Uh, the microbiology part of it is what kind of fascinated me the most. And... Uh, Went in with kind of, you know, my guard up a little bit, but then as time went on, um, for me, this is just not a job. It's not just a paycheck. I actually enjoy what I do. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's always a challenge. No matter what, you're always going to be challenged. So if you're looking for a challenge or you want to challenge yourself, you're always going to learn in this industry, no matter how long you've been in it. Technology is always changing. Well, I'm going to be a professional baseball player, but then... They said I was too short, so no. I'm <laughs> okay. No, okay. So my path into this industry, I fell into this industry. Um, I didn't think anything about wastewater. I didn't think about anything after you flush the toilet. You know, growing up, and I would just say, "Well, uh, how good it's gone. It left our house, right?" Or when I turn the water on to brush my teeth, it just there's water. That's all I knew about it. Um, I had got out of the military and was looking to get into law enforcement. I had a friend in the industry who had um, a lead position, had a little bit of rank in the, at this facility here, and kept trying to entice me to come over. And I kept saying, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to go and you know, uh, mess with sewer water. And he said, hey. So his main takes were, it's a great job, it pays great, you, know, uh, it, it, you, you learn a lot on the job, and it's recession proof. I said, no matter how bad the economy gets, you will always have a job. And I said, okay, sign me up. I'm going. So I came down. I got in it for a job and fell in love with it. You know, I, I saw that it, it, was, it is my career now. And there's something very rewarding about uh, doing a, a service and returning it back to the community. You know, whether it be somebody who lives in this city or even if you did it for a city, a neighboring city, to know that you have, because people don't think about it every day, they just get up, brush their teeth, go to work, they grind out their job, and then they come home and use a restroom, and you know, that, that's that, that's life. Uh, but to know that uh, this industry made that made sure that, well, we made sure that that water was cleaned properly, and we made sure that we returned it back to service properly, and then the guys who work on the freshwater side, drawing out from the wells, hey, we're going to make sure and treat that water, we want to make sure and get it to your pipes, and we want to make sure that you have perfect PSI, so when you turn your water on, there it is, magically. So uh, and it's a rewarding job. I, I love being part of uh, an environmental job, having a job in the environmental industry. State, um, you have to take a test, and there's certain grade levels. Um, right now, I'm currently a grade three operator with the state of California. Um, I also am dual certified with the state of Arizona as well, so I hold um, licenses in Arizona and California. Um, right now. Um, you know, I did my grunt work. You all start. You always start off at the bottom, and eventually work your way up. So technically, I've been in the industry since 2002. It's now 2016, so 14 years later. Um, now the operations supervisor. Um, there's multiple paths you can do. Like I do wastewater. You can do freshwater side. Um, there's the distribution lines that gets the potable water out to customers. And then there's a collection system after you use the water and it goes down your drain, there's lines that actually bring it to our facility. So there's groups that handle that. Um, <clears throat> one of the things, if you're really, really into science, you can get into laboratory, you know, um, and like real analytical stuff. Um, 
It just really depends on how far you want to take it. There's guys that have actually, um, like Dr. Ken Curry, he's got his PhD and he's written numerous books and it really gets into like, you know, we've, we've got microorganisms that we refer to, most operators basically know, you know, um, nitrification and denitrification, but then they're, they'll break everything down. So it really just kind of depends on the individual, how much time you want to put into it, and how much you want to learn. I mean, you, I've been places where I've seen guys retire with just a grade one license, and then you've got, you know, some guys that are probably even younger than me that are grade fives now. You know, it just depends on, it just really depends on the individual. So I'd say anyone that's uh, looking to get into the industry, I'd say go for it. You know, um, there's a lot of schools now, especially with the drought. Um, a lot of schools, especially, you know, the junior colleges, I know Sacramento State has a program that's strictly water industry. So um, there's a really big push, um, you know, and as we continue to grow as a society, uh, it's going to become, we're going to start looking at different avenues of, of being uh, sustainable when it comes to, to water. Well, as of right now, it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to get harder. I would encourage uh, my own children and other, other young people uh, to, get, to get some schooling under their belt. Um, you know, you can get your basics done, your sciences and all that stuff, but they also uh, do have courses now at uh, San Bernardino Valley as a course for uh, wastewater technology. Um, there's, there's different junior colleges and I believe even four-year colleges that have forms of that. You don't need a degree yet to get into the industry at entry level, uh, but I would say over the next 15, 20 years, you just might, you know, so uh, to get, a, to get a, a head start on that, to leapfrog and, and some of the other competition, maybe get right out of high school and go right into college, and even if you're not sure if college is for you, because college, I understand, it isn't always for everybody when they're pretty simple. even knock out two years, get an associate's and, and get your sciences done will definitely help you get in the industry, and then once you get in the industry, uh, climbing the ladder it'll only help you to have a degree, uh, even if it's a two-year degree, uh, a four-year degree, definitely. Somebody who, we have a lot of engineers getting in the industry right now, um, for whatever reason, whether it be civil engineer or, or they're, they're jumping into this industry, I think because they see uh, really it's booming, you know, the influx of, of, of all these wastewater facilities going up. Uh, you know, I, I always say about 33 million people in the state, probably 28 million of them right here in Southern California. So. There's going to be more wastewater industries popping up. There's going to be more uh, booster stations and small plants and small, you know, the, the, the new style of plants come with a small footprint. I mean, there's going to be creative ways across the board. And that's not even get into uh, biosolids plants that do just uh, methane gas and renewable energy and uh, 2019, 2020 taking food waste, actual food, you know, that we scrape off our plate at Denny's instead of it going into the trash and going into a landfill going into a different bin and going to a facility that does biosolids. So it's uh, it's a booming industry, it's an interesting industry, and it, I still stand by what Chip said a long time, it's a, it's a recession-proof industry. If you're in this industry, whether it be maintenance or lab or operator, or collections, distribution, uh, you'll have a job, and you're going to have a good job at that. All right. Juanita, I think you're frozen. Yeah, I don't see her. Oh, am I frozen? You're my back. Internet. back. I'm back. There it is. Okay. Um, so my favorite science questions about those videos is, uh, what did you notice and what did you wonder? Did it make you, what stood out? Go ahead and unmute anyone. I'm going to practice my teacher wait time. Once you get into the we don't, system, we don't need any degree for an entry level of work. Okay, thank you, Edna. You don't need a degree to get into the, any entry level. Donna, you wanted to add? That uh, there's always going to be water um, careers. It's not going away. 
It's definitely not going away. Those are these are the one a set of jobs that we cannot outsource, right? And let's not uh, work on that. Let's make sure that we're giving our kids those skills. Um, what we've discovered when our when it comes to our recruitment efforts is um, when we start talking to kids, we started talking to try and recruit for these classes based on things that would make adults move, right? So we started talking about how much money you could make and, you know, benefits and all this stuff. The kids didn't understand any of that. The kids are like 15. So I want you to flash back to when you were 15. That made no difference to say that you made $70,000 or $50,000. It all sounds big and exciting to the kids. So what we instead, what we found was a more successful recruitment tool for getting kids interested was what, uh, was what, was it Dayton? I think it was Dayton said about giving back to your community. It's this little piece of like, when you work in these water careers, you're like a community hero. You're a, you are the, you are the, you know, I don't know all of the, who is Superman? Like when he's not Superman, Clark Kent is his name, Clark. Yes. Okay. It's like you're Clark Kent because you walk around. It's not like you're famous, but everybody utilizes what you produce. So, um, so making that argument to the kids. Also, we make a big, uh, we make a big deal about girls in STEM careers. But what I've noticed as being a science teacher is that sometimes, sometimes it's more difficult to keep the boys engaged during science. It's like, let's leave no one behind. Um, and, um, and the guys that are in this industry are really kind of like, just, you know, really kind of manly men. And they like to see that they like to see other guys doing, you know, being looking cool and, and doing their stuff. So these guys really connect well with kids. So all I'm saying is that as you're going out and you're doing your hustle, make sure you find somebody that's going to connect really well with kids. And when you get into the industry, I think you'll find that acronyms to know we're going to move on. Juanita's frozen. She'll come back. She always does. So there's going to be even more money going towards this idea of getting students really ready for careers. There's also a strong workforce programs grant, the strong workforce programs grant. Um, I was telling somebody earlier uh, that that grant, I just discovered that it's, it is for CTE, but the teacher doesn't have to necessarily have a CTE credential. So if you're going to try out, like, let's say the science courses and you wanted to be able to support a science teacher with some additional funding, it looks as though that might be a funding source that's interesting for you. And then um, CCAP, which is the College and Career Access Pathways. This is an MOU for those of you that are living at the district level or at a school site leadership level um, where you are offering college classes on a high school campus, um, especially now right after or during, you know, post school close school closures um, a lot of the universities started doing classes online and some of these water classes are available online and it's a great opportunity for kids to try out some um, getting some college credits while they're still in high school which is also something that moves you on up in your college and career readiness indicator um, I didn't add this one but I wanted to add it and actually I'm gonna share my screen again Bryce uh, it is for the SSP. Everybody's been talking about SSP this morning. SSP stands for Specialized Secondary Programs Grant. And I wanted to take you to the CDE website for that. In fact, I'm going to put this link right here in the chat feature as well so that you can um, have it when you go back to And there for the funding amount, you can receive up to $100,000 for your application for your new class. Um, and they have about $4.9 million to give out. Look at the dates. So it just opened, or actually it's going to open. The 2021-22 cycle is going to open uh, tomorrow, day after tomorrow. When is the 30th? Sometime very, very soon. Yeah, tomorrow. 
And it's not due until September the 10th. I think I'm going to also reach out to Patricia in this moment because she was the one that was mentioning that she got an SSP. Patricia, would you mind sharing your SSP experience with the rest of the team here? Uh, you know, it's been, it's a lot of hard work and you have to, you know, write an entire course or two. We were expected to write two courses and, um, it was great though, because what was nice about it is the grant is there's so much money in the grant that not only can you pay yourself to do the work, um, but you can also get tons of, uh, equipment and, supplies and things that you need to support your program. So we bought a, a whole new laptop cart with special laptops with Wacom tablets and pens and so they can draw using digital drawing. Um, but also, you know, the grant, you know, they, they want you to pay yourself for the work at your hourly rate. So that part of it has been really nice too. And it's been really um, cool to be able to offer these unique classes to our students. Um, you know, we, like I said, we're in an arts magnet. And so the, um, you know, this is just another level of, you know, uh, arts integration into science that makes it just such a, an enriching experience for them. So uh, it's been really wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Patricia. Has anyone, uh, I, you, what I appreciate about the SSP is that those funds are really not very restrictive. They leave, they leave you a whole bunch of flexibility, which isn't the case with a lot of grants. A lot okay. of grants, it's like, no, you have to spend it here and it has to look like this. And we have to have all this, you know, documentation that shows X, Y, and Z. Um, but they are really like, we want you to be creative and creativity requires some like creative license sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can, I mean, you know, when you go to the conference, it, it's really amazing to see all the different programs that people are creating. It's really yeah. nice. Yeah. So I would highly recommend that you, even if you're not familiar with writing grants, that you check that one out. It's not super hard to write, uh, right to the RFP, the request for proposal is pretty reasonable. Um, are there any questions or has anybody else had any experience with SSPs? I did put the link in the chat feature. Know that it opens up pretty soon in the next couple of days here. And you got about a month. Questions, comments, concerns. If not, we're going to move forward. Okay, Bryce, take us to the next uh, to the next set of slides. And we are going to go ahead and get started with some of the curriculum that you will find inside the folders for this course. So there's an activity that we're going to do, but I'm going to switch these activities around. So he's at the right spot. Go, um, go one more forward. One, um, go forward Anita, one more. Can I add one more thing? Sure, yeah. Uh, they do uh, assign you mentors mm -hmm. in these grants to help you get moving and help you figure out like in the website and how to use it and all the forms that you have to fill out. So don't be afraid of on that level. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Anybody else? So uh, close and critical reading is a strategy that uh, that we would like to make sure is highlighted any opportunity we have. Go forward to the next slide, please. And so I wanted to switch these slides around because uh, Allison spent uh, a considerable amount of time talking about um, talking about the drought. And so we wanted to take a second to practice jigsaw. Go ahead and move forward. CER is claim evidence reasoning. I think most of the people on the call already know about that. So uh, there are uh, three articles. It looks like four here, but there's actually three because article two and article four are listed twice. And what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to take a moment. We're going to put you out into breakout groups and we are going to ask you to um, 
ask you to skim these articles and we're going to jigsaw it, which means that group one is reading a different article than group two and group three is reading a different article than, um, than the other two groups. When we come back together, we need you to give us a little bit of a summary so that we could hear what claims are being made by each one of these, uh, by each one of these news sources. Um, and then uh, we're going to put that on a Jamboard. So uh, let me put the Jamboard link in the chat here. Um, if you hopefully you are familiar with Jamboards, we did use them the last time, but essentially you're just going to click on that link. You should probably click on it now so it opens up in a different tab. And um, in that Jamboard, what you will see is that you will see that there that we're asking you to do a couple of things. Summarize your article in a few sentences. What's the cause of the problem and who is most effective? Is there a solution that's provided in the um, in the article? And uh, Let's go ahead and get started. I think we'll start off. It's they're short. They're fairly short articles. So I'm going to start off by giving you about five minutes. All righty. We were confused in our breakout room because we were in breakout room two. And uh -huh. I thought we were reading the Smithsonian one. I finished reading it and got on the jam board and noticed the link was for article one which was supposed to be breakout room number one so and donna was scientific american Wait no a minute. so we were in group two we're supposed you said article mm -hmm. two was the smithsonian one so that was for breakout oh. room two, right yes so it and then was. donna was reading the scientific america because she thought that was the one we we're supposed to be reading so we kind of got confused as to which one to which read. article which article were we reading oh so, well you got to read one article right Yes, we did. So just really quickly, anybody who read Article 1, you want to tell us um, just in a couple of sentences, what was the problem and what was the solution in that article? Or the claim? Anybody who read Article 1, which was the Smithsonian article, the Colorado River Runs Dry? Uh, the I think we read, this is Clover from Group 1. Hi, Clover. Hi, I think we read the right article anyway. Okay. Um, we, we decided that California is totally following in, a, in Australia's drought footsteps. Um, we talked about the fact that we're um, kind of, no, that's not the article. That doesn't look like the art. Yes, it is. We're coming to the game a little late, but as you can see, my fellow roommates really put some good detailed information. We can do the same kind of reforms. We also mentioned that um, Australia did not forget its environment when it started thinking about the water for its people, and that's important. And they did mention that climate change, lower rainfall, urban development, and was part of the cause of the problem. And I really stress the fact that we are the problem. We, it's, it's an anthropogenic problem. We want to develop. We want, our, we want our cities to grow and be vibrant, but the backside of that is sprawl and still ignoring underserved communities who are already struggling for a proper water supply. You need to stop me when you need to stop me because I can go on and on. I will stop. I was I was uh, muted. I was saying thank you. Um, oh. But yeah, no, definitely. And I'm glad that you brought up that piece because I think in everything that we do, there has to be an element of environmental justice. We are coming from um, Southern California. So I don't know about where exactly everybody is from, but here in Rialto, what you'll notice is that um, communities of color do um, historically um, historically hold more environmental burden than other communities. And that's an important thing to also bring up. And because um, these issues are local issues, nobody is going to solve these problems for our communities. We have to figure out how to solve them for ourselves. Um, the idea of utilizing Australia's model, I want you to hold on to that for the next part of the activity or the next um, couple of activities that we've done talking about pollution a little bit. Okay, the second article, which I put in the wrong order, and I apologize 
apologize for that was called devastating drought seems inevitable in American West. And that was from scientific Americans. So that was supposed to be on um, slide two or actually, yeah, it's the wrong article at the top, but that doesn't make any difference necessarily. Did, is there anybody who wants to talk about article two about the devastating drought in American West? So maybe you didn't put your slides on the jam board, but you read that article and you want to talk about it. No, devastating droughts. Nobody read article two. Scientific well, maybe while you're talking about those things, could you also mention to them about the tool of EnviroScreen? Yeah, of course. So um, a lot of you might be familiar with uh, Cal EnviroScreen. And actually, I'm just going to uh, share my screen for a second. Um, Cal EnviroScreen. If you are teaching, especially if you're teaching AP Environmental Science, you have to know about Cal EnviroScreen. Cal EnviroScreen um, basically gives you um, all of your environmental burden information on an interactive um, on an interactive map. It's not just showing water. It's also going to show um, it's also going to show a variety of different risk factors, and they give. Um, indicators but the mapping tool is i think what's the most interesting to me and actually it leads into what we're going to do after the break so actually i'm going to hold on to this so if you're looking here um what this map is showing is it's giving you uh it's giving you a scaled score based on environmental indicators and so um i'm here in rialto which is down here, hold up. It breaks up everything by census track. Oh, I'm not, I, I don't have a mouse, I'm sorry. So it's doing all kinds of crazy nonsense. Um, are you guys familiar with Cal Enviro Screen before I spend too much time talking about it? But you see these percentile uh, values, the percentile values um, are calculated based on um, air, water, housing, you know, overall uh, environmental threats. It gives you the uh, socioeconomic factors, and it also gives you race and ethnicity profiles. So you can have some really deep conversations with students about, um, about some of those things. Thanks for bringing that up, uh, Clover. Uh, I, uh, a blah, blah, blah. Article two, article two, no? Let's go on to Article 3 about uh, Vegas. I did see some people on Article 3. Article 3, if we're summarizing in a few words, go ahead. Uh, so, hold on, I have to get back to there myself so I can see it. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, this article, it was uh, basically talking about how a guy died because uh, they were building this project, this giant tunnel. Mm -hmm. um, to Las Vegas um, to supply more water. So I guess there's already two big tunnels or something. I couldn't quite understand two projects that already occurred. Um, and mainly Las Vegas gets their water from Lake Mead, mm -hmm. uh, but it's dangerously low right now. So they're trying to come up with other ways to get water for Las Vegas. And because of the dangerous and difficult work, um, a guy died from working. So did they give a solution in that article? Uh, a sol well, a solution to him dying, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> they talked to, they talked a lot about like OSHA and stuff like that. But, um, but the main thing was they were really trying to explain the tunnel and how it, like what it's going to do. And, um, the the solution was building this tunnel but also they're trying to do a 300 mile surface pipeline mm. to get more water so they're they were most likely advocating for that surface pipeline. So excellent. So I wanted to just highlight those reading strategies, especially for our career technical education teachers that, of, that often don't get those kinds of strategies in their professional development because it is very um, specialized and specific. So um, 
thank you for going through that with us. And we are going to move forward before we go on to our next steps. So we've got two additional activities that we're going to go over. One of them is an introduction to geographic information systems. And the second one is an activity is a group activity that talks about water use. I wanted to make sure that you read the articles that went along with, um, you read the articles that went along with the drought because, uh, Environmental principle and concept number five talks about multiple perspectives as to how to solve these problems. And so in one of the activities, the activity we're going to do right when we come back um, is going to be you making arguments within your own groups about um, which features should really be allocated more water and why. Um, we're going to take a little break. And by little, originally, I think maybe because of the timing and we want to make sure that we get through these two things, um, I think it's going to be close to about maybe 13 minutes, 12, 13 minutes here um, to get another cup of coffee, to use the restroom, whatnot. We will meet back again at 1118. Is that okay? 1118. And I will see. Go ahead and just, uh, you know, turn off your your video and mute yourself and we'll see you back at 1118 or maybe they're here Oop, somebody's timer all right let's get started oh clover you are here hey what's going on all right let's go ahead and get started with uh water decisions and so can you can you go back in the slides bryce yeah, you can have a copy of those articles. And they're actually, everything's inside the folders. So just like last time, I'll give you access to the folders that, uh, to all the information that's inside the folders. So um, every day we're making all kinds of decisions about our own personal water use. So I'm going to highlight environmental principle five again, which is, um, you know, that water use, sorry, is that, there are lots of different perspectives when it comes to the utilization of natural resources. And so, um, and so what we're going to do, what I'd like you to do is I would like for you to calculate very uh, quickly, use this water calculator to calculate your own water use, like your personal water use. Everything that we do, including, you know, the purchasing of our food, uh, utilizes water in some way. And so uh, let's see how much water we are, we are using. Um, so in the chat, what I added was I added a link. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Bryce. Those individual decisions are decisions that we would like our students to also, um, to also grapple with. Uh, this link that's in the chat right now will take you to a calculator that are going to ask you some um, some simple questions about your own personal water use and the water use in your household and then it'll give you a calculated answer that compares your water use to the average water use for other people inside of your state so go ahead and take a few moments and actually calculate your water use and then um, if you feel comfortable sharing if you could put that in the chat when you're finished i'm going to say that this part of this activity will probably take us ah uh, when i did it earlier i said it took me about mm, maybe five minutes so we're gonna set five minutes on the clock i'm going to play a little bit of music here if i can figure out how to do this and then go ahead and get started so click that link and calculate your own water use. Let's see.
Looks like Bryce and myself are done. If you have calculated out your water use, go ahead and add that to the chat. That's what I was thinking too, Katie. There it is, Andy. You got me beat by a couple of gallons there. Man. Let's see, one more song to let everybody finish up here. Anybody know the artist of the song I just played? You think you know the artist? Whoa, Kathleen, what are you doing over there? I don't know. It seems like a big number to me. That's a huge number. Oh, no. It's, I, I put the... Um, no. Sorry. I mistyped. Okay, good. Yeah. Decimals, decimals have a point. <laughs> I smile. Let's see. Allison. Good job. That's much better. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I just let the water run all day long, 24 well, that's, that's what it looks like. I know it. No kidding. I was like, the problem is Kathleen. No, just, get <laughs> <laughs> just get Kathleen to move to Arizona. Everything will be fine in California. <laughs> lawn is the problem your lawn yes outdoor outdoor is so much higher than indoor. yeah yeah for sure were you surprised well no because i look at my water bill and mm -hmm. they always break it out like how much is indoor and how much is outdoor and mm -hmm. it's just like i could tear up I mean, I could tear out the lawn. I, I actually did tear out a patch of it. Mm -hmm. Planted some 
water drought resistant, but it's just a tiny bit compared to the rest of the giant lawn. Yeah. Amy said it was the virtual that killed me. Yeah, the virtual. Yeah, that was pretty tough. Me too. Was it your was it your meat? Was it the meat? Eating meat, I think the Amazon possibly, the, the shopping. Oh yeah, the meat <laughs> and the shopping. Yeah, exactly. It was like, oh, do you like I tried I was a vegetarian for three years for the environment. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I gotta talk everybody into it. <laughs> Exactly. It was my family. My family was like, look, this can't go on. <laughs> Andy said, yep, eating meat got me too. Yep, there it is. The most water because they account to growing the animal feed. Oh, they also count the feed. Look at Bryce dropping all kinds of facts in the chat. <laughs> all right, who are we missing? Okay, we got Donna. We got Patricia. Do we have Patricia's? Yeah, I put mine in. Okay. Katie, Amy. Uh, let's see. Asma, did we get yours? Oh, you tried to be a vegetarian for two months. Yeah, I feel you. Edna, did we get yours? Working on it. Okay, got it. We're going to let Lovely Day finish playing, and then we'll come back. Give you a couple seconds. I'm glad they didn't ask how many times did we do order from first <laughs> They haven't added that to the uh, to the checklist yet. I'm sure, that must count somehow. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what? But we're gonna go with little wins. I, according to them, the U.S. average is 1802, and I haven't seen anybody's minus Kathleen's like little snafu there with the uh, decimal point. It uh, exactly that's over the national average. So that goes back to, uh, I think it was what Allison was saying earlier, which is, you know, in California, we actually do a pretty good, we do a pretty good job. Or maybe it's also the surveyed people. You guys are at the water, like, <laughs> workshop. So maybe, so maybe that has something to do with it. When you go back and you try this with your classroom, if you go back and try it with your classroom, whatever class you're teaching, um, I think it's a good uh, view for students and it leads to a lot of really good conversations about what, what they're doing with water that they might not think of because for me when I first did it it was definitely the meat thing and when and that was part of the reason for the decision to become a vegetarian but if you can't become a full-on vegetarian it's a great time to think about the meatless Monday thing right because I felt like we got some points for saying that we don't eat meat every day I read an article just about general health and wellness and uh and American mindset and uh the article I think it was written by BBC and they were just like, enough with the protein, America. Like, what <laughs> you guys are you guys are focusing too heavily on the protein. You really need to be focusing on other nutrient uh, nutrient rich foods, not just protein. Excellent. Okay, Bryce, next slide. What we're going to do now, so if we were doing this activity with our classroom, that would be the first set of activities that are highlighted in this kind of class in the first uh, set of class that goes along with Waterworks. There's a water use efficiency actual certification. Um, and so as students are researching different jobs that are in the water agency, that's one certification that they'll see. They also see distribution one and treatment one, and then there's wastewater distribution. Um, in addition to talking to all of those other, um, talking about all of those other departments that I think were brought up in the video. Um, going back to those EPNCs and thinking about uh, decisions and decision making, um, the next activity is really thinking about breaking you up into four different uh, groups. So let's just say that perhaps you are thinking about yourself as a um, a water provider. Perhaps you're thinking about yourself as just um, a farmer. Perhaps we're thinking about ourselves as um, as just a regular citizen. And so in our groups, what we're going to ask you to do is we're going to ask you to have a conversation about how you would uh, would rank each category here. Actually, do I have access to share this document? It's Allison's. Yeah. Okay. Copy link. Here we go. Um, how you would, um, would rank the value of, uh, you know, who gets the most water here, where, um, in this chart, 
actually, let's see if I can share my screen for a second. In this chart, um, one would be they have um, the highest, the highest value. So like if anybody's getting water first, we're going to rank these things. This organization or this idea is going to get the most, you know, it's going to get first dibs on the water. And then 10 being this is the person that's getting last dibs on the water. Okay. Or the, um, the ideas. Um, you have a link here in the chat feature. I'm going to put it in right now. Um, to that document. And then we're going to break you up into three groups, the people that are in this chat. We're going to break you up into three groups and one group. So one group, you guys are acting as a water agency. So someone that's working in the water agency. The, the next group, you are just a member of the public, just a regular member of the public. And then uh, the third group, you are a farmer or a, you know somebody in the agricultural business. So I really want you to channel in your perspective as that entity, water agency, a member of the public, or a farmer. We're going to give you about five to seven minutes to go back to your group to have a conversation about how you would rank each one of these categories. Again, one being this category gets first dibs on the water. And then the 10th category is this is the last dibs on the water. So this one's the, their water demands are the least important to California as a state. Okay. Questions. Can somebody tell me, unmute really quickly and tell me what we're going to do when we get into our breakout groups. Go ahead, Donna. We are going to, depending on our title agency, public or farmer, going to category one through 10, the list of how we want to distribute our water. Very good, excellent. All right, and everybody has access to this Google Doc, correct? Did you try to click the link, everybody? All right, and so go ahead and uh, go and enter your breakout group. Find some consensus. Mm. Okay, I put, I put the close all the breakout rooms button so they have 50 seconds now 50 them, seconds again about oh, and, uh, oh you guys the farm were you guys the farmers patricia and edna man you guys came to consensus super quick and uh and we yeah we were just we were admiring everybody's work to get to consensus and uh, how yeah. you ranked everything i'm gonna um human consumption was third your crops get first dibs and you get second or third dibs. <laughs> Your crops first, my animals second, and crops then are, crops are our lives. <laughs> they're our bread and butter. That's but it. you have to be alive. Like, you have to be alive to, to, yeah, <laughs> to yeah, not that important. That's true. Not that important. Okay, cool. Well, well, Excellent. You know, yeah. We were assuming that I don't know, maybe that's not the right assumption that. This would be a percentage of how much you get. Mm, you were divvying it up. Yeah. So that, uh, no, I think that's fair. I want to know hey, the I water think. agency group. They can't make. They can't move forward, or they're stuck. The water agency. Who is in the water agency group? Welcome back, everybody. We were enjoying watching you try to come to consensus. We couldn't hear the conversations, but we could see the numbers changing on the Google on the Google sheet, and it was just as entertaining. Um, we're going to go backwards. We're going to start with the farmers, and we just want you to give us your rationale. Explain the rationale behind your ordering. Uh, start with priority one, and then go all the way down to priority ten. Who wants to share for uh, the farmers? Where are the farmers at? Ooh, ooh. There you go. Go ahead. Um, okay. Uh, well, how about if I do one through three and then other people in my group do a couple other ones or something? Sounds, that sounds fair. Go ahead. That sounds great. So we as farmers, we talked about how, you know, our farms are our lives. So we can't, we can't have a living unless we irrigate our crops. And so that, that was number one and two for livestock since we couldn't we didn't know which one we were so we ranked those the highest and then we kind of went back and forth a little bit about <clears throat> human consumption because we looked at this as if 
we were divvying this up with percentages, like who's going to get the biggest percent of water. Mm -hmm. uh, so we didn't, we put human consumption third just because we fought, felt that that wouldn't take as much water as irrigating the crops. Um, and then we put transportation fourth because we thought our crops needed to be transported. So that was important. Do you want to take it over, Edna, or, um, sorry, I forgot your name. I could do it. Okay. Okay, for, we choose number four, transportation, definitely since we are into farming, as our bread and butter, we need to be able to transport our, <clears throat> crop, our uh, for them to become money. So that's why we put for, for that one. For number five, we choose energy development because we need it for our uh, farming. And number six will be it's just an add-on for us. So symbiotic process, we're into farming. At the same time, we want to have some something that deals with fish and wildlife. Excellent, thank you. Was Katie the third person in your group? Yeah, Katie, Katie. Yes. Yeah, so our final ones um, that were least important to us as farmers um, were the ecological value. And we had a little debate about this and kind of what it means, um, but we didn't think it was super high on our list. Um, and then the manufacturing of cars and steel and clothes. Yeah, we'll probably use some of that on our farms, but um, not super high on our list of water needs. And then lastly, urban development. Um, we said that was really unimportant to us as farmers. Dun, dun, dun. All right, thank you farmers. Great job, round of applause. Uh, the members of the public, members of the public, you wanna share your rankings? Who had the highest priority and why? Um, so, we had similar to water agencies with human consumption being one and um, farm irrigation being number two. But then, you know, the here's where we had our, our debates. Uh, we picked three as fish and wildlife. Um, if you ever have a husband that definitely needs to go fishing, that's uh, the, you know, we needed that for, how did um, you put it, Clover? Um, had a special word for that, decompress or something like that. Yes, and um, people need, to, especially people who are living in urban and um, suburban environments, they need that recreation and decompression is important. You guys, we went back and forth. We had so many good reasons for so many different answers. And so finally, we just had to randomly pick something. So then uh, four went to livestock. I mean, we do eat our hamburgers. Uh, so we need, you know, a little bit of that. And then uh, five went to ecological value. That was just a, a throw in the dark kind of uh, category for us. Um, we definitely knew that the bottom few were where we wanted to be. Um, we had seven as our energy development because, you know, we don't, really get hydropower right now and if it does come back around it's going to go to las vegas more than us since we have all our solar and wind energy coming our way uh, so we kind of put that as a seven um and manufacturing you know why do we need to keep buying new when old is just as fine um and then of course urban development uh clover was saying they're building out in the by Palm Springs, why are they building more suburbs in, the, in Palm Springs? There's no water. So kind of put that as a nine. And transportation, well, we're not sending anything. You know, we should consume our own fruits and vegetables in California, so. Um, I don't know uh, if our other partner had any other things to say or Clover, but. 
Yeah, thanks for um, thanks for sharing that for us, uh, Donna. Being an excellent spokesperson, good job. Clover did add a little bit. Is it who was the other person in your group? Oh, that was me. Asma, do you wanted to add anything to that? Um, I mean, she already covered everything. I mean, we had a great discussion. Clover made a point. Donna also, you know, contributed. We all had a great discussion. I guess one of the things that we're talking about was uh, maybe as as the public, there are some things that we we knew were, were already there that we could give rankings to, but also things that we can change, like in terms of transportation, trying to encourage buying locally so that we're not always shipping stuff. And then um, I guess the, one, the ones that we really had more of a discussion about was manufacturing, the manufacturing industry, because if you're a shopper, then maybe you would give it a, a higher ranking or a lower ranking, I would say. Mm -hmm. But it was a great conversation. Excellent. I think it's interesting. Uh, what I think is interesting is that you guys said that you kind of did a uh, like throwing dart ball, uh, throwing dart at a board in order to do the four and five for the ecological value and the livestock. But you, but you didn't really. You gave it a pretty high priority. You put it above things like manufacturing. So even though you were, you were, you didn't really, um, you weren't super confident, I guess, in where you ranked it as a four or a five, you still recognize that those ones were higher than some of, you know, some of the other ones, which I think is really interesting. Oh, in the last possible second, the water agency got it together. Well, <laughs> friends, listen, somebody was changing our numbers. So we just left it alone. Right. Okay. Like, tongue in cheek route here, Andy and I like, who's going to pay us the most for this water? That's how we went. Uh, which is probably not at all how the water agency does things, but that's just what we decided to do. And I don't even know if these people would pay us the most. Did you hear that, Bryce? That's how she thinks the water agencies are making their decisions. I like I it. Not really I think like that, it. But I thought it was kind of funny to go there. We're <laughs> not. We're not. And how come you guys don't have a one? I'm just oh, teasing. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, that's, these are the kind of conversations that get started. There you go. No, I, I think that's great. So talk us through your rankings. You don't have a one, but you do have two eights. And no, that's, no, there should be one. There's a one on my end. I don't know if you guys can't see it. Maybe. Okay. Maybe, uh, maybe Bryce needs to refresh. Um, go ahead and talk us through your list. And uh, <laughs> Andy, I just kind of threw them in there last minute, but based off of our conversation, but we were just kind of joking around the ones who may pay us. So developers can pay us the most and manufacturing can pay us the most. Right. So you can kind of see, we tried to rank the ecological ones lowest. This is not my personal thoughts, friends, but this was just kind of our, our tongue in cheek version. So I, you can kind of see it up. Yeah. That, that was our, our thought. Go I ahead. guess, yeah, we were wondering just the relationship the water agency has with these other sectors. Cause I feel like from the public sphere, it's like, you know, they, they promote individual, you know, reduce your consumption, things like that, and what you can do as an individual, but we don't necessarily know their relationship with farms, with manufacturers, um, so. Very good. You know, I read somewhere that people, uh, what people think about their water is less, uh, has less to do with what actually is happening with water and more to do with how they perceive their government, the trust that they have with government. Um, and so I think that this is an interesting conversation to have. We enjoyed watching you come to consensus on this. And as a student activity, I just want to, um, come back to that idea. Um, how might this activity be helpful for students or why might this, what might this help you to discover about student thoughts? I think it would be very eye opening and I think it would be eye opening amongst the students to hear their different viewpoints and their different perspectives because they may not all come from the same place. Definitely. And um, the water agency public and the farmers, so the multiple perspectives that I selected today were just kind of selected at random based on, you know, based on the conversations that we, we knew we were going to have earlier. We did also talk a little bit while you guys were in your breakout session about how interesting it would be if one of the perspectives was like a Native American perspective. So tribal lands, whoever covers tribal lands. Um, 
another perspective might be somebody from uh, a like a soda manufacturing person. So something more specific to kind of just get kids talking about those ideas. I think Allison wants to say something about co-equal goals. Hello, I'm on, I'm just getting hype. Hi, everybody. So I've used this exercise a lot, and it's always fun and always informative to watch people go through it. Um, I always talk about the co-equal goals at the end. No matter, your local water agency has to make these decisions all the time. And obviously their customers are number one. The people are always number one. But there's laws put in place about how much they have to release to an environment, for example. Like for us, it's the Santa Ana River. We are required, most of the agencies along the river are required to, to allow so much water to remain in the river and to put water back in. But at the state level, there's the co-equal goal, and that is really important. We can say that we want farms to uh, be number one, or we want livestock to be number one, or energy development, or whatever. But legally, the State Water Resources Control Board must take that water code that you, I posted in the right into account. The environment and everything else is a co-equal goal. So especially with Delta in water, which is imported water for us. So I just wanted to bring that up. It's just kind of an interesting factoid in there. And that's part of the decision-making process when they reduce allocations. Can we still manage that co-equal goal? Because that's water code. That Excellent. And Donna, I love what you wrote in the chat. Have students take it home. This might be a great um, home exercise. Have every student kind of take it home and talk it over with their family and see what rankings they would give. Um, have some kind of compromise together, come to consensus together as if they were the water agency, taking in all kinds of public input, right? Because that's kind of what happens. Those water meetings are open meetings. They get all kinds of input from the public. And then somebody has to make a decision on that. And usually it's, you know, a legislative board or uh, of some sort. So all kinds of different applications for this activity. Know that this is an activity. Allison is saying that she uses this activity in the high school. So, I mean, in the college level. So it's a college level activity as well. And it'd be perfect for these CTE courses. The next thing that we're going to talk about. So let's go back to the PowerPoint presentation is we are going to talk about geographic information systems. For those of you that have your cameras on, can you just give me a really quick thumbs up if you've heard about geographic information systems before? Give me a thumbs up. Keep it up if you have done GIS before, like you've done any kind of GIS. Oh, excellent. Look at this. You guys are not newbies at this. Perfect. Um, so what we're going to look at is we're going to do a brief introduction about GIS. So going back to the classes and thinking about what it is that um, you've seen today. There's water works. There's water careers in the 21st century. And then, um, and then water and GIS. So GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems, and Geographic Information Systems um, are basically um, maps. It's really working off of this idea of maps and overlaying maps with different information, right? Um, and so when you're talking about GIS, you're often talking about layers. So you're exploring a certain data set by looking at different layers. Today, what we're going to explore is we are going to explore a case study and this case study occurred in 1854 in Soho in, um, in London. Like a, it's a little borough in London. Um, before we do that, I wanted to share my screen really quickly so that you could see a couple of different ways. I'm going to show you how to do this um, without making an Esri account. Oh, this is something else I wanted to show you. So on a side note, I'm sorry. Earlier today, we were talking about Santa Ana, the Santa Ana River. So there's, if you're by the LA River, so just the ones local to us, there's the Friends of the LA River, which is a nonprofit organization that really focuses on advocacy for that surface water, the LA River. If you are talking about the Santa Ana River, then I wanted to introduce you to the idea of IE water keepers. So the Inland Empire water keepers do that same thing for the Santa Ana River watershed. So I just wanted to share that with you. And let me just really quickly before I lose it, put it in the chat feature so that you can have that. The IE Water Keepers also has um, some curriculum. They do uh, professional development as well. And I've worked with them. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty cool. Uh, let's see. We, I should say we have worked with them, and they're pretty cool. 
All right. Um, so GIS is, um, it, there is an organization or a company that does GIS in our um, area and that it, that area is, sorry, here it is. This is where I'm trying to get to maybe. Where am I trying to get to? This one. Okay. And it's Esri. Esri is based in Redlands, which is pretty close to where I personally live. Um, and, um, and so every educator for GIS gets an account for free. So if you wanted to um, get started with this, I'm going to put this in the chat. All of a sudden, everything is happening at my house. So I apologize. I put this in the chat so that you can follow along with me. If you do not already have an Esri account, we're going to take a second just so that you can make one. Um, you're going to click on where it says get started. And then um, when you click that, you're going to come down here where it says learn ArcGIS. ArcGIS is just their like proprietary software. Once we come here, what you're going to see is that there's a lot of ways that you can um, experience GIS. We're going to experience, so now hopefully you're toggling be between two different, um, two different tabs. What I want to say, I think it's Edna who is um, teaching a math, is that in the new math framework, there is a whole brand new section on data science. And so I want to point to this one in particular. Know that data science comes from this idea of overlaying, um, a lot of it comes from this idea of overlaying spatial data on top of maps and using algorithms in order to do that. We're going to go all the way down to where it says teacher. You're going to click where it says teacher and they have a whole hub specifically for teachers. There's the teaching tools and the lesson ideas. The lesson ideas are really great. You get... Um, you get access to all kinds of lesson plans that are super helpful. I'm going to click down at the bottom where it said experience uh, GIS with an educational trial. And then you're going to put in your, your first name, your last name. You're just basically telling them that you were a teacher and you can get your free, um, your free trial. I'm already logged in. So take a couple seconds and fill that out. <clears throat> and then I'm going to put a map in the chat that we're all going to access together. Where does it say teachers? So keep scrolling down. So if you were on the previous page, let's see. If you were on the page that looks like this at the top, learn ArcGIS. I clicked from the original page that I went to. I clicked learn GIS. Then this page popped up with the man at the, on the mountains. And I scroll down where it says choose an experience. And you got to go all the way down to the bottom and there it says teachers. Did you see it? Um, yeah. When mine came up, it said get started. Okay. So when you clicked get started, did you, there should be something where it allows you to just create your new um, temporary account. And that education account is 100% free. I'm going to show it to you both ways where I'm logged in as an educator and I'm also going to show you one where I'm not logged in so that you can see what that looks like because sometimes it's a hassle to be logged in. Okie doke. How's everybody doing? No, it's not working. Uh oh. Okay, get, you, you, you get have started. to click. Uh, not for, you, have, um, you have to click free uh, software access. Where do I find that? It's like if you scroll down a little bit after you click teacher. Okay, well, I haven't got to teacher yet because it just oh. still says why. What is GIS? Get started. Okay, so did you click the link in the chat here? Let me start over. That's what came okay. Up. Okay, so let's start over from here. Okay. So are you on my screen? Do you see my screen? I can flip off. Okay. Yeah. I see your Does your screen. screen now, yeah. does your screen look like my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So we're going to scroll down a little bit. You see where it says learn ArcGIS? Okay. Okay, I'm going to click that. You go back to your tab and you click that too.
Donna, you with us? Uh, it's slow, but I'm, I click learn. <laughs> okay, good. And when the man comes up in the mountains, you're going to scroll down to where it says teacher. All right. That's the page. Excellent. Okay. You there? Okay. It's teach with GIS. Okay. Okay. So you're in the teacher one. When you click the teacher, you should see a new page that comes up that says teach with GIS. Excellent. And then underneath the teaching tools, lesson and ideas, it says free software access. Okay. Now we're going to do the free software mm -hmm. access. And then you're going to log in. All right. Now that you've done that, I'm going to stop for just a second and I'm going to, I'm going to explain what the GIS does. So basically uh, what you are going to do is when you are in the work mode, you are accessing maps when you're in the work mode. Once you finish accessing your maps and overlaying your data and doing something and you found out something, then what you would create with the ArcGIS software is you would create an app. And the purpose of the app is to communicate your ideas. When you first do this, 100%, um, you are going to use the pre-made lessons. And what I can tell you is that the lesson that we're about to do is a pre-made lesson. Um, if you are not logged in, or if you weren't logged in, um, you could still access this lesson because it's one of their pre-made lessons. So hopefully you can toggle back. Am I frozen? Can you guys hear me? Okay, perfect. Go ahead and toggle back to the um, to the Zoom call. And I've given you a link, which is the fastest way of doing this. I've given you a link to a base map. And the base map is called Cholera Outbreak 1854. So 1854 in a little suburb of London called Soho, um, there was in 10 days, there were 500 people that showed up uh, with cholera and basically died within two days. And, um, and at that point in history, uh, there was a gentleman by, doc by the name of Dr. Snow, and he was, an, he was an obstetrician. This wasn't necessarily his area of expertise, but there was a larger theory out there in medicine that cholera was caused by breathing bad air. They called it a miasma. Um, and Dr. Snow didn't believe that that was actually the case. What Dr. Snow believed was Dr. Snow believed that it was the result of drinking bad water, but he didn't have any, that was his claim, but he didn't really have any evidence uh, to support that claim. And so when this cholera outbreak occurred, um, he took it upon himself to figure out if he could determine the, loc you know, if he could make an argument or collect evidence that would support his claim that this was really by bad water. So the first thing that he did was he created a map. So now we're going to, um, you're going to come back, you're going to toggle back and forth with me. So if you come back to the Zoom call, the map that's on your screen um, should be what they would call a base map. So inside ArcGIS, the base map can look a variety of different ways. So when I click this, um, this icon here that says base map, um, what you should see is that if it was a current map of Soho, what you would be able to create with uh, or access with ArcGIS is actual physical imagery, an imagery hybrid, which is just basically like a map that has the listings of all of the names of the streets and whatnot. You could do a street map, a topo map, which is a topographic map, uh, a terrain map, light gray, dark gray. So you can see all the different icons, all the different kinds of maps that you can um, access. One of the things that I like to do when I'm first introducing GIS is I like to access a map that, um, that I recognize. So the easiest thing to do is to actually put in your physical address, like your home address or your school address, right in this field right here where it says find address or place. We're going to skip that for right now so that we can stay focused on this cholera outbreak. But um, 
And this is a historic map. So the historic map comes from the 1850s. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. And behind that map, what you see is the current map of Soho. Does everybody see what I'm seeing or what I'm talking about at least? Yes, no, maybe so. Somebody's going to have to unmute because I can't see where you guys are. I do. Okay, excellent. So um, on the left hand side, if you click where it says content, what you'll get is you'll get the different layers that have been added on top of this base map. So the first one I'm going to do is what Dr. Snow did was he at first, if somebody was acquainted with someone that had cholera, he immediately went to that person and started asking questions. Um, he wanted to know what they had done right before they got cholera. Um, and what he did, what he did primarily was he um, created little dots to list every single location of a person. Whoops, sorry. Oi. Sorry. Of a person that came that came down with cholera. Let me see if I can. Sorry, I don't have a mouse, so I'm using the the keypad. The way that he created these uh, these little pins, that's what they're called in GIS. When you click on the pin, the pin tells you the address and how many deaths occurred at that address. Um, these pins were overlaid on top of the map, <clears throat> but on my layer here in in the GI in the ArcGIS um, portal, if I click it. One of the functions that I can do is right here, you'll see these little icons underneath the uh, title. I can show the table because he created a table. This is actually also really helpful for making that math science connection. So you've got the number of deaths and then you've got the addresses where they could be found. Um, the other thing that he did was he overlaid, he overlaid the water pumps the water pump locations. So when you look at this information, so when you look at that information just from the table, it tells you something a little bit different. Like you, maybe you can't make heads or tails of it, but when you see it on the map, do you see how the pattern Juanita, I can't hear you. Um, you're going to click this icon here that says uh, change style. So it looks like the different shapes and you can access different styles of maps. So for this instance, we're going to access where it says the heat map. So I'm going to select that and it changes. It changes the dots to um, to concentration levels, either high or low. So when you looked at the original table, you saw that at some of those dots, you had only one person die. At others of those dots, you had two or three people die. I can bring up the table again so that you can see that. You see that? The deaths at the different locations. Oh, and Broadwick Street, it looks like Broadwick Street kind of had the most deaths down here. If I could scroll down, which it doesn't look like I can for some reason, um, you could see that at one at one house or one um, building, there were four deaths. I'm going to give you a second so that you could play around with just those three people or those three things. So the first thing that we did was you're going to open up the content window. You're going to click on where it says cholera cases. You're going to overlay the water pumps and you're going to change your original map you're going to open up a table and change your original map to a heat map. Why don't you try doing that? And I'm going to stop talking for just a second so that you can do that. Thank you. 
So when Dr. Snow did this same thing, he wrote in his journal, within 250 yards of the spot where Cambridge Street joins Broad Street, there were upwards to 500 fatal attacks of cholera in 10 days. As soon as I became acquainted with the situation and extent of the eruption of cholera, I suspected some contamination of the water of the much frequented street pump in Broad Street. So, uh, if, so as soon as he did that, do you see how the heat map helps to provide a more visual representation or a, an easier to understand representation of kind of that um, quantitative data? Um, what he noticed also was outside of the people that lived near the pump, nearest to the pump, that he tracked hundreds of cases that came from schools or restaurants and pubs. And as he was going through and he was doing his research, what he recognized was that there was a popular drink at that time. It was a bubbly drink and it was called sherbet. Um, and they basically took a spoonful of powder and they fizzed it inside of water and the water that they were using were from that Broad Street, um, that Broad Street pumped. And so he developed, he utilized his map in order to develop an argument that um, that contaminated water was the source of this outbreak. He actually wasn't the first scientist to do this. Um, he was following, um, he was following the footsteps of another, uh, an American um, scientist by the name of Valentine Seaman, who, um, who was tracking yellow fever cases in New York, and he used a very similar method. So these were the first times that those, um, that those came up. He saw that there were some outliers, and those are the people that are way out on the outskirts, and he had a lot of questions about why it was that those people might have passed away and whether they were um, somewhat related. And when he was doing his, uh, when he was doing his research, for example, um, there was one case that was really far out that he couldn't figure out. Uh, when he was doing his research, what he discovered was that the, the lady and her daughter that had passed away, um, that when she was doing her, his interviews with the neighbor, the neighbor said that the lady really enjoyed the water or the flavor of the water from the Broad Street pump. And so what they discovered was that she would have bottles of that water um, picked up and actually delivered to her home, which was a lot farther. It fell outside of that um, heat area. And, um, and it just so happened that she had had a delivery that day. And by the next day, both um, herself and her daughter had passed away. Questions about um, about ArcGIS, just in general. Oops, here we go. Ah, my model. Are we practicing? You can change inside the base map. What you're able to do is you can also change the transparency. I don't know why. Let's see. There we go. Oy. Zoom in, zoom in. Sorry about that, guys. I, you really need kind of a, a mouse for this. It's more helpful. There you go. So if you click under where the heat map, um, the heat map, some of the features are you can change the transparency and you can also change like the visible range which i'm not going to do because that's you're i'm doing i'm actually changing the visible range also every time i zoom in and zoom out on those features All right, so what have we done? We opened up the layers. We overlaid uh, the water pump, uh, the water pump layer with the cholera case layer and with Snow's cholera map. Um, we were able to open up the, uh, the table and do some evaluation with that table. And, um, and see how that table data was translated to the map. Juanita, can I say something real quick? 
please. So um, I use I use ArcGIS a lot in my college class, and I know a lot of people who use it in high school classes. They have, I, if you don't use it or you don't have a free account, they have so much available online for free. This was a little bit different program for us to write because there's no, if you take the water works class or the, the next level CTE class, there's certs, it's preparing you for certification so that when you're 18, you can get those certs. Esri works a little bit differently. They are for sure the industry standard. And in that they have their own certificate class which is a pretty, pretty robust class. Um, but they are more than willing to, they have whole people teams that will help you do any of the, the education features. I so hope there's somebody out there who's gonna be a ArcGIS uh, person. They are the happiest and they love, they love working for this particular company. But it's really good basic knowledge for all of us anyway, is how it actually works. So I just wanted to, to bring that up. No, thank you. So I want to show you how this information. So what we've been working on is we've been working on a map and how that information gets turned into an app. So if we were going to, if you're logged in, one of the things that you can do, sorry, if you're logged in, one of the things that you can do is you can save your new map. So what you've just created, sorry, all these tabs. What you've just created is you've created your own new map. So what you'll notice here is that I did that entire um, that entire lesson to just figure out how the layers work and what I was turning on and off the details and how to change the style and whatnot. I did that whole lesson without being logged in, right? If you're logged in, it does look a little bit different. Um, here's what it looks like when it, when you're logged in, and um, and so you have more capabilities. You can search for layers. You can have a living browser. We didn't have to do that because this activity was already like pre-built for us. Um, the snow map was overlaid. Then the cholera cases were overlaid. Normally, each one of these layers, so each one of these little boxes is where is something that you would have to search for. So inside this add a layers piece, you would add a layer maybe from the web or search for layers. So um, we did this as a practice. So like I was saying, if you would like, and since you're logged in, you could just type in the name of whatever city you are in. And what you'll notice is all of a sudden, immediately, it brings up a new map. There's not going to be that additional content, but because I'm logged in, now I have the option to save. So I can save it as <clears throat> something completely different. So I can save it as, instead of the cholera map, um, I can save it as whatever I want my title to be. So maybe I'm doing the Rialto tree map. This is actually something that we're working on in my district tree canopy cover. Um, when you are saving, it's going to save inside of your um, inside of your personal, <coughs> excuse me, inside of your personal account. What I would suggest if you're going to save, um, if you're going to save it and you're going to publish it to the public, that you add tags to um, to whatever it is that you're saving. Total tree canopy um, total tree canopy map of the city and it's saving inside of my uh, whatever folder that I have designated so when I click save my map it's just available just for me um, if I wanted to add another layer I can search for different layers um, so maybe the layer that I'm looking for is uh, water pumps. If this, if this layer exists, which means somebody else has created a layer that has, or a, a table that has all that information, so the exact location for where the water pumps are, then it would show up here. I haven't built that layer, and so it doesn't currently exist. So it's actually a great community science kind of activity um, that would allow students to actually add like a body of knowledge. 
I want to go back to the Cal Enviro screen um, page because essentially that's exactly what this map is as well. Um, in the Cal Enviro screen map, that Cal Enviro screen is just a GIS map that um, that your students can access. That somebody has overlaid a whole bunch of data based off of um, based off of environmental environmental census track records. So I'm going to come over here to Rialto again, right here on the Fontana Rialto border, because that's basically where I am. I don't know if this is my exact census track. I could keep looking and zooming in, um, but it gives me my pollution burden percentile based off of the different characteristics and there's a list of those characteristics. One of the characteristics that is great to explore with students happens to be the drinking water, the drinking water burden. Um, when we're talking to students about the uh, about drinking water and the drinking water environmental burden, it's a recognition that it has um, lots of different, there are a lot of different factors that go into that number and researching with students how that number comes across or how that number, how they get that number is another really great activity that occurs in, um, in this set of classes. The, um, each water district is required annually to send out, um, to send out a little pamphlet or something that explains to you all of the different things that are inside of the drinking water. Um, Allison, did you want to share a little bit about that? It's the consumer. Sure. Sure. I'd be happy to. I was just going to type the confidence in. report. Yeah. It's the consumer confidence report. Sometimes it's called the water quality report. It's required to come out on July. It's required to be published by July 1st for the previous year. So right now we just hit the, July, um, July 1st, 20, uh, 2021 deadline, which meant that 2020's report was completed. And I, I urge every one of you and every one of your students to take a look at this document. It lists any um, irregularities. It lists your water supply, your water sources. It makes an excellent lesson in and of itself. Now, now it's not required anymore for them to physically mail you one, but they have to provide access to it. So Usually they'll send out a notice on your water bill saying it's going to be on their, our website on July 1. They also have to furnish it in multiple languages. So let's say, for example, you're primarily a Spanish speaker and it's not on the website. You contact them and they have to provide it to you in Spanish. The law is actually if you have more than 10 percent of any per, any one population, they must provide it to you that way. So. It's an excellent tool for everyone to use, and um, it shows everything that's been going on in the water supply. Always check footnotes on all of this stuff. It tells you about testing. Um, it should make you feel better about your tap water, to be honest. It should make you feel like tap water is drinkable because they work really hard. to. They don't want anything going wrong because they don't want it in that consumer confidence report. You're muted, Juanita. Sorry about that. The other thing I wanted to show you is what a an app looks like. So what you were working on is you were working on the, the map. And by the time you get finished, you want to be able to communicate that information somehow. And so this is an example of what the uh, of what an app looks like. So inside of an app, you're able to do what is called a story map. Um, that's that's the one that we've gotten the most bang for our buck, which is basically the map in itself should tell a story, but sometimes you need that additional narrative. Um, this is the 3D map, and they're constantly updating. Um, so just because you learned how to do something once doesn't mean that that's the end all be all. So you can see that they've switched it up so that you could see exactly how many deaths. So these little tiles right here correspond to how many deaths um, were written on the original were written on the original table. And when you're looking at the data in all those different ways, you saw it as a table, you saw it as a 2D map, you saw it as a heat map, and now seeing it as this 3D map, each way emphasizes a slightly different relationship between the data and um, 
and just uh, the location in space, right? Let me show one more diagram. So this is the Venoro diagram. Um, and then here are the street pumps. So just emphasizing that so that you can communicate better with the public. Here it is in a slightly different way. So here, those are the deaths from cholera. Here are, here's the layer with the water pump locations. You see the pumps now, the pumps are showing up as a 3D, 3D example. When you, when you look at it like that, the relationship between those pumps and, um, and that variable is almost too difficult to overlook. Like I was saying about the, uh, the sherbet, uh, here are the pubs. What do you notice about that? Yeah. It's wow. It's like, oh, no wonder he thinks that or he believed that most of the cases that came from uh, that that were uh, suffered from that year actually came from people drinking those sherbets at that pub. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. So here's again, let's see the brewery myth. They thought. <laughs> dramatic effect um but nonetheless just a really interesting way of looking at that information here it is again um just cited in a different in an article a blog that i found about john snow questions about gis I want to emphasize, if I could emphasize something, is that uh, on, site, on this Teach with GIS um, website, if you go to Lessons and Ideas and you explore more Lessons and Ideas, you'll see that there's tons of stuff about water, water balance on the planet, and, um, and there's lots and lots more. And when you open it up, the lesson is pre-written for you. However, I would, I always suggest uh, search all content. Let's see. Let's find a keyword. Let's have our keyword be water. Um, what I, I always suggest because the portal is changing all the time that you don't just take the directions are really well written, but you don't just take the directions like verbatim because, um, sometimes the language has shifted a little bit, but it tells you exactly, um, it tells you exactly how, long each activity is going to take. Other questions about that? No? All right. Well, then let's move on. Map your community cleanup. Oh, there's another, uh, there's an app, like a cell phone app. Um, that I also want to recommend, and that is Survey123. It's an app that comes from, um, let's see if I can, I don't know if GIS, I don't know if you can see it um, on your phone, but the Survey123 app actually allows for students to be able to create their own um, data tables that are geocached. So the most uh, difficult thing when you're trying to do, when you're trying to create your own data set is to get that geocache data because it's actually giving you the lines of latitude and longitude. And most of us can't do that in any realistic, like reasonable, um, reasonable way, like find that data. But your cell phone automatically geocaches every time it connects to the cell phone towers it triangulates your location in time and so in that triangulation if you just ask a survey question and then you respond to the survey question in a certain spot you can create your own um, your own data table and then it can be uploaded to uh, to the GIS portal ArcGIS inside of your classroom as a CSV file. So um, if you're interested in using more GIS, um, there's a whole class 
that was built. That's the uh, CTE water and CTE class. Um, and so there's definitely lots of activities in that CTE class. But if you're just interested just personally to include it in your um, AP environmental science class, or you want to do something with Academia, because somebody was telling, I think it was Donna was talking to me about Academia. Um, please feel free to dive into that website, that ArcGIS. It's, it's, fairly user friendly. And like I said, uh, or like Allison said, uh, Esri in general is um, super, super helpful. They are constantly wanting t more teachers to be able to engage in this kind of technology and share it with the kids. So, um, so I wanted to share those resources. Uh, I also wanted to share that if you were interested in, um, in there is there are the global the global goals the global goal fresh water for can you hear me now we can yeah okay sorry I wanted to share one more thing, and this is the global goals for sustainable development. So going back to those environmental principles and concepts and inter um, interdepartmental, I know we got a lot of science teachers here, but if you're trying to connect your science with social issues, I would really also highly recommend that you look at the global goals for sustainable development. This is... Um, these are referenced, there's actually a whole uh, project. So that, you know, we have the science project and there's the math project that's prof teacher professional development for across the state. The global goals are a, a department all in itself. And one of the global goals has to do with clean water and sanitation. So this clean water and sanitation um, goals give actual actions that, um, that, you know, that, as an international community, they're trying to get people to, um, to advocate for. So what you should know is even today, 78% of people in third world countries still are living without clean water supplies and up to 85% of those people don't live in areas with adequate sewage treatment. And so going back to that cholera piece, while it seems like, oh, that was 1854, that was a long time ago, people are still struggling with that. What they actually found out at the end of the day after they finished, after Dr. Snow finished all of his investigations was that the contamination from that pump came from a woman that um that had cleaned a diaper very <laughs> close to that water pump and um and it somehow seeped into that water supply um and they found that out because there was a this is just a fun side note for me because i get into all that like gross nerdy stuff is there was a reverend reverend whitehead who was really trying to disprove uh, he was really trying to disprove Snow's um, Snow's ideas about water contamination. He thought that uh, the cholera epidemic was just a plague sent from from heaven, and um, and he was the one that originally went around and was doing uh, was doing the asking, and that's how he, they found out about the contam the contamination. Eventually, they took the handle off the pump, and then uh, and then voila, that you know, cleared itself up in the, in another science class. So if you have access to the previous, um, the access to the previous folder, um, the, there's a lesson in there about blue baby syndrome and blue baby syndrome is also related to water contamination and it's nitrates in the water. So if you're interested in that, then let us know. We'll make sure that you get that. All right. Bryce, I think we are ready to move on. We're almost done for today, guys. We are uh, we have about 19 minutes left. We want to make sure that we have time to answer your questions. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, today, we visited use of those models that came from Esri um, and analyzing data, strategies that went along with analyzing data. We looked at curriculum pieces that you would have found in all three of the CTE-specific courses, sort of the, the G-level CTE courses. So the uh, water careers, the water works, and then the last one was water and GIS. Can you go on to the next slide? Um, we would like to continue on with the gods and needs. And I feel like, is there anybody that didn't see this yesterday? Maybe Donna. No, Donna? 
I saw it yesterday. Oh, okay, perfect. So um, those interactions between natural and human social systems, again, even in these classes, we wanted to highlight those pieces to make sure that the students really understood that. And, um, and going back to those UN global goals, um, these global goals also highlight for students kind of what they can do in their own community to take their local efforts and turn them into like international efforts. So I'm just going to highlight that one more time. Um, so here are the targets. And um, with each target, there are, if you, if you dig into the site a little bit more, it gives you some, um, some ideas of things that are, you know, things that people can do in order to help with this, this target of having clean water and sanitation for the entire planet. And I think, do we want to do the gods and needs? Let me pull up the gods and needs and I'll put that in the chat. And yeah, I think that's it for me. I think, I think the gods and needs is a good thing. Yes. So go ahead. You're, I'll put it in the chat. Allison, you want to bring us home here? Sure. Sure. I was just typing. Um, Lillian had asked about the PowerPoints and the other information. So um, they will be, let me turn my camera on. Sorry, I thought I did. So we will be sending via Dropbox. Actually, Modoc um, said they would do that. We will be sending out the PowerPoint, which has the, the links in it. And then we will be sending, I believe, links to the files that Juanita has referenced throughout today. So you should get that all in an email, but it probably won't be till next week. Juanita, you did got some needs yesterday, but I think if we all go to that jam board. Yeah, I put it in the same, I put the link, um, I put the link in the chat and um, in mine. So it's still called God's and Needs Day One, but if okay. you slide over to the next slide, it's day two. Okay, there's day two. All right, so um, if you haven't, you, all of you have used Jamboard, obviously. Um, that was actually a new concept for me. Thank you, uh, Juanita and Kathleen, for teaching me. It would be great if you would let us know what you got out of today, but what you still need from us. Um, so if you could please put your sticky notes in, let's give it Bryce, maybe, maybe two minutes to do that. Cause we're going to follow up on all of this information. Yeah, I want to take the, uh, just a second to say thank you, everybody who showed up today. Um, I saw a lot of people, a lot of returning faces, which we weren't necessarily expecting, but we're excited to see you, and hopefully you got something sure. new, um, even if you were with us on Monday. So, um, yeah, thank you for that. And then um, the gods and needs will just be there. Yeah, we're just working on it for, I'm going to give it like one more minute. And then we'll go on to the next slide. We're almost done. I'm practicing my teacher waiting, Juanita. Very good. Excellent. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, while everybody's still doing that, if I, I'm gonna, just going to share my screen really quickly because I went back to the... Um, I went back to the um, the Cal Enviro Screen website, and um, in that Cal Enviro Screen website, under Environmental Topics, um, you can come down to where it says Water, and um, and it'll give you the public health goals that are um, related to water, the notification levels. So those are the health health advisories related to water, and also this framework, this assessment and framework for the human right to water in California which I think is just really interesting, you know, and then this is, um, you can get all these information, all this information and these downloads, which I think are great for, um, you know, just reviewing with students, going back to what Allison was saying. And, and also what I was saying earlier about people's consumer confidence tends to have less to do with what is actually in the water and more about their, you know, their, thoughts about government and whether they can trust their governments, both local and, you know, local, state and federal. Um, so having those, leading those conversations, um, I think is a really great idea. It leads to um, just better communication on all fronts, but also 
just remember that because of those environmental principles and concepts, whatever subject you're teaching, it is a part of the standards because the EPNCs are a part of the standards in both the math framework, the science framework, the health framework, the history social studies framework. It's even being referenced in the art framework. So all of the visual and performing arts framework. So, um, so it's relevant for all subject areas. And of course, career technical education. Okay. Thank you, Juanita. Um, Bryce, next slide. Yay. Okay, we did give you a minute earlier to, um, you know, post forth any more questions. Uh, I just was looking at the gots and needs and I'll take both days of the gots and needs and see, I'll synthesize them and then get back to you um, as a group, once I've worked with MODOC, to, if, if there's any available answers. On the last slide, you're going to see my email address. So if it's been a while or you didn't get what you needed um, addressed, please let me know. Does anybody else have any other questions for any of the three of us? I see, I see in the needs section that it said that the, um, that the GIS stuff went really fast. Um, and I understand that completely. GIS, when I did my workshops with GIS, I went through a full week long, week and a half long with follow-ups and everything. So there's a lot to be seen in GIS. But I also want to refer you back to that same website and encourage you to just uh, tour that website. Because when you go to the teacher portal, even if you just Google search teachers and GIS and Esri, when you go to that teacher hub page, at the bottom of the screen, there's self-guided lessons. And the only way to really know and you know fully appreciate the GIS is to practice it. But now you have your account and that account will transition over. So yeah, so please more GIS stuff for sure, Lillian, you will find lots of that stuff. They also sell books and I have a few books at my house, but um, they have books and the books also give you lessons guided. But when you go in, sometimes the, um, the user interface has changed. Each time I go in, the user interface changes a little bit. So you just have to, it's always updating. Uh, along with what Juanita said, when I first started, because I didn't take a GIS class, I actually started on the kindergarten and first grade lessons. I started like at that level and then worked the free ones and then worked my way up to the more complicated ones because I didn't know a thing about it. And the, the K through three actually go really quick when you're an adult, but it did give me the basics because there's not, a, and they do have tutorials, but it's not always available. So that was easier for me. Um, let me see. Uh, Kathleen, I yes. usually does our wrap up. Are you here? I am here. I um, think you were, and then I'll see you guys at the very, very end. Okay. Well, I, I really don't have much to wrap up because we already did, but I just want to say, um, one more time, isn't Juanita and Allison amazing because this, the, the depth of the, and the quality of the work that's been going on in Rialto and the work that Allison has done um, developing the CTE courses, um, they're there for you. And the resources are there. And I believe Juanita and Allison are there for you as well to answer quick questions, I'm assuming. Um, but we're so glad you were able to join us today. And we look forward to um, seeing your responses on the survey and getting out your goodie bags to you. Good luck in, um, in the fall, I guess school starting um, right around the corner. So nice meeting all of you. Yay! Uh, shout out to Kathleen too. What if it, she really guided me. Poor woman, just I probably drove her crazy when we were. Working. Kathleen's amazing. She is, she is. So much excitement. She is. So uh, the reflection piece of this, you know, you're going to get a goodie bag and you're going to get a fifty dollars gift certificate, and but I need you to do this survey for me and some of you who are here on monday have already done it but i need you to do this one also and there is the link uh which is in the chat and actually for mondays i've gotten the majority of them back and i'll be starting processing the goodie bags and the gift certificates right away the reason this is so critical not only do we need your feedback and it was really good feedback on monday is there is a question in there 
where I get your name and your address and your email again. And that way I can verify your attendance, but we're mailing your goodie bags and gift certificates to you. So I don't currently have that information. So please, please get your survey done and get it done as quickly as possible because I really want to get this stuff off. And one more slide, please, guys. Last slide. There's my contact information. Um, and we have been, we've had a request that we contact you again in six months with a brief survey to find out what, if any, things that you implemented from this class. So you will be hearing from me again. I'll make it very brief, but I'm super happy we did this, but we wanna make it useful. And if it's not useful and it's not things you can incorporate in your class, we need to know that too. So we can change it, change it up in the, in the future. So without further ado, thank you so much. I'll hang out here for a few more minutes if anybody wants to chit chat or has any questions. And uh, I just wanted to throw one last thing in because some people have been asking me for my own personal email account and I definitely don't mind giving you my email account. All I'm saying is that I am not great with email. Just that's my own character flaw. I try my very best, but I end up getting a ton of email. And even if I answered email all day, every day, which I don't because I wouldn't get anything else done, I still wouldn't get back to everybody at the same time. So feel free. You can send me an email, but it's way better for you to send Allison an email and then Allison will be like hey Juanita somebody's trying to talk to you but, and not only that some of you might have the same question or that need that the same need so because Juanita is you know I'm semi-retired as is Kathleen but Juanita is not so I try to funnel stuff to her and get it quick and not, like sometimes Juanita and I talk at midnight because that's the only time she's got so, um, you know, that's better if you can funnel it to me and I'll make sure we get a response to you. Right. And I just want to chime in and, and, and say one more time, thank you, Bryce, for helping us. Oh, yes. and our Yay, Bryce! Sponsors. Um, Allison, if you want to take the lead on, on thanking our sponsors one more time. Absolutely. Because our spot without our sponsors, we wouldn't have this. So hats off to Matt. That was Adrian Hightower who really started this going. Modoc, of course, with Tiffany, Katie, and Bryce. And then they are the administrator for WIA, which also sponsored this financially. So hats off to our sponsors. You know, give them a shout out if you can. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you.